Now, more from this hearing on the Clinton administration's drug control policy. As a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee heard from National Drug Policy Director Barry McCaffrey and Coast Guard Commandant Robert Kramick. Subcommittee will now reconvene. At this point, I'd like to welcome uh, General Barry McCaffrey, Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. General, we thank you for being here today. Good to be here. If you would, uh, please stand and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee sub is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. If you would, uh, I know you've had a chance to be watching some of this testimony, but uh, if you give us uh, a condensed version of your opening statement, um, we would appreciate that. And obviously the balance of your statement will be included in the record. And well, you can proceed uh, at any time. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to come down here and discuss uh, interdiction in general and also respond to your uh, concerns about the IDA study in question. Uh, with your permission, I will uh, submit for the record uh, my prepared comments, which include, I might add, all the briefing charts that are over here. And I say that because I think this is the best synopsis, uh, not only of the IDA study, but also where we think Admiral Kramick and I and the rest of the interagency working group, uh, where we are on the, um, the whole notion of interdiction. Jackson, so ordered. Now, if I may also uh, begin in sort of an incongruous manner by thanking uh, the bipartisan leadership of the Senate and the House for what we believe to be the final action on the uh, drug uh, budgets. Uh, now, we've looked at the results. We think we've got not only what we asked for, uh, but more. And I think uh, it'll take us a couple of weeks to sort it out. Uh, but if I may praise your leadership and others, Denny Hastert and Rob Portman and Steny Hoyer, and Rangel and the many others in the House, and then I called Senator Lott and Daschle and thanked them for their uh, support. I think you've given us the tools to do our job, and indeed um, the 96 budget, which restored full funding to the Office National Drug Control Policy, uh, I think did us a, uh, a great service. We will put together the people, the men and women we need to manage uh, this absolutely essential uh, responsibility. Now, let me, if I may, I'm going to go very briefly and just touch upon some elements of the argument that I would like you to consider. First of all, uh, what we've done in uh, the 97 budget, what I've done since I was sworn in on 1 March, uh, is to draft and support the national drug strategy. Uh, I had asked the president to put it in front of the American people in Miami several months ago. It was a product of it got in late by law. It's supposed to be in on 1 February. Uh, the Senate was pretty gracious about giving me uh, a little latitude to work it over. And that is a national drug strategy. And I underscore it because I came from two years running the interdiction process of the United States in Southern Command. I have worked this issue since day one of this administration and indeed in my last responsibility as the J-5 of the Joint Staff uh, worked it during President Bush's last year uh, from the Pentagon. And when we wrote that drug strategy, we said fundamentally there can be no magic solution. There is no silver bullet, although there is absolutely one first priority, and that is to motivate America's youth to reject illegal drugs and substance abuse. Now, however, as you look at that strategy, you note that goals four and five fundamentally relate to what we're talking about today. It says we must, we owe the American people a defense of our air, land, and sea borders. And that defense is not just the Customs Service, INS, Border Patrol, Coast Guard, but an extended defense forward all the way into Burma and south into the uh, cocaine-producing countries. And then goal number five, and it was written very deliberately this way, we need to break foreign and domestic sources of drugs. In the end game, 
the ultimate victory would be that there were no illegal drugs available and we had operated against demand to reduce it. Uh, so I tell you this because I want you to understand at the outset that I am fundamentally in agreement with your own concerns expressed publicly and the uh, really the logic behind the IDA paper that says interdiction is an essential aspect of reducing drug abuse in America. I couldn't agree more, and that's why next view graph uh, hopefully will be, um, I, I'm going to skip by this and, and the next one. Just be aware these charts are available if you want to direct questions to Admiral Kramer or I. These are the transit for, uh, zone counter-drug forces and the uh, source zone counter-drug forces. I have spent the last three years of my life working on this problem. I understand the interdiction and source country challenges. I have listened to the people in the, in the region. Uh, I have made the rounds of every command and control facility from all the uh, agencies here in the United States. I got the picture. It needs to be improved, but you, but you ought to understand as you look at that that those are real work by thousands of men and women, by 3,000 flights a year out of the military, the CIA, Customs, Coast Guard, uh, and others, that this is a tremendous effort involving National Guard airmen who are on the ground in Peru, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, and almost in Venezuela. Uh, that, it, that it's a real effort, and we're very proud of it. It involves Joint Interagency Task Force South in Panama, which worked for me, Joint Interagency Task Force East in Key West, Florida, uh, commanded by a Coast Guard two-star, and we're doing pretty good. Next view, Graf. Uh This is a tough one, but let me uh, make sure you got the note of what I'm saying. I don't know what the truth is on the last five years of uh, politics, but I do know the truth on the raw numbers on the drug budget, and that's the truth right there. That's what President Bush and Clinton turned in over those years, the requested budget and the enacted budget. Now, I'll tell you what, what comes out to me. Without question, Congress cut President Bush's drug budget and then Clinton's budget every year until this year. And each year, the president, whoever it was, then requested in the following year the same level of funding to which he had been cut. So both the executive branch and the Congress wound down the combined funding to support interdiction and source country. You have to turn that around. General, let me ask you a question. Could you have one of your staffers just draw in roughly where the funding that we just gave you? Where would that bring, be? Well, bring unfortunately, that I don't have it on there. But what you're going to see is you did exactly what I asked you to do and more. You have turned it around in this year's budget. And now I'm... I, we, we, just to, just to get a con, we just want to get a, a feeling for where that would be. Uh, it, you, you funded us, I think, 15.35, I think, is what right. you're going to find you did. Which is in excess of the request. So it Absolutely. comes up where Mr. Micah, for example, is drawing $200 million in addition to the request. That's it. You, you okay. came through. So we're heading in the right direction. And, and for the record, I guess, if you would, uh, Mr. Micah, just in, uh, take. Uh, it's the greatest staffer in the world here. Mr. <laughs> just draw for us. Uh, let's take 90, 1992 for those that may not be able to see the chart. You know, if you would allow me, I'd much rather have Mr. Kinney do the drawing okay. in. Um, uh, and I say that for a couple of good reasons. Mr. Mike uh, is very pleased. Mr. Mike is, didn't do very well in the third grade on crayoning. <laughs> and I think he's got it too high. But, but, but let me just say up front that this and the 98 budget that I'm now writing will be our opportunity to demonstrate our commitment to interdiction. Okay. So Could, I thank you for it. I, I, I'd just like to make one point because funding is key here. If, if you could just show us 92 with a, with a marker and 93 and 94, 95, 96 and 97 and let the record show that, that this administration uh, 
and other administrations, but the funding comes from Congress. And Congress funded, I believe, when we took over control, we gave full support of President Clinton's drug war in the past You actually years. cut them by 1% each year. It doesn't show up. It's too bad I didn't do that in a better way to demonstrate. You actually cut them 1% each year. But you are correct. Your funding support for the administration's request the last two years has been good. I just want to make that as a yep. part of the record. Uh, that's, good. Thank you. that's a good point. Uh, take that one down, if you will. Let me run through this, because I think they want to get to questions. Uh, uh, this uh, chart here, uh, like many data in the interdiction world, can be interpreted a bunch of ways, some of them harmful. You're looking at the worldwide production of cocaine. Uh, some of these numbers are soft, but I think they're good enough for us to discuss the issue. What you see here is that essentially somewhere between 800 and 1,000 tons is the production capacity of HEL annually. And uh, then out of that, the good guys of the world, whether it's Peruvian cops, Bolivian uh, Umapar, Colombians, or Detroit policemen, take some of it. We get sort of a third of the cocaine every year. The U.S. authorities, uh, whether it starts with the Coast Guard or back into the uh, police forces of America, get another 100 tons plus. It goes up, it goes down. This year, it's up dramatically. We're doing pretty good in the first quarter of this year. Now, here's how I would not interpret that chart. I would not interpret this to mean that regardless of how much money you gave us on interdiction in source country, it didn't matter, it didn't make a difference. It seems to me there are a bunch of other factors that you ought to ask me about that affect our ability to get Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, Mexico, Burma, Afghanistan to affect the drug supply and drug smuggling. Well, I would also tell you is that that is uh, hundreds of metric tons of cocaine. I put in my testimony 450 metric tons in the last four years. It's 1,400 metric tons in the last seven or eight years that didn't end up in our schools and in our communities. So I, have, I think we, we're going to be careful in our language, listening to the earlier testimony. I applaud U.S. law enforcement not only for breaking gangs, for breaking infrastructure, but also for taking kilograms of cocaine and heroin away from uh, criminals. And I think they ought to keep at it. And when they do it, they reduce the potential addiction among young people in America. Um, now, uh, next one. Um, the, the, uh, well, tr I tell you, the, the three of them I didn't show. If I may just direct your attention, uh, Mr. Chairman, and your colleagues, and those in the audience, because I pass these out. Here are three pages of the great review of the IDA draft study. And I'm not going to put them up on uh, briefing charts. You, you have them available. You're welcome to look at them and make of it what you would. I would also hold up, and just so you're aware I know about it, here's the document that I got in May. Uh, I actually didn't read it on that day. I read it about two weeks ago, and it's a draft document, unclassified, uh, very complex work by three brilliant men from a famous analytical institution in America, a nonprofit that comes out, calls the shots as best they can. Now, my guess is, and what happened that day, essentially I had uh, Admiral Kramick, a close friend who I've worked with for years, came in with one of his officers and with, uh, I think I had some of my people there uh, at a minimum one, uh, we did several issues, got briefed on. One of them was me briefing them on Mexico. Uh, we talked about the interdiction conference. We talked about uh, uh, Bob Kramer was about to start a big operation off Puerto Rico Virgin Islands he wanted to educate me on. And then finally, he and Captain Boyer briefed me in some detail about the Ida study. Uh, it was my view then that this was a loser of a proposition. I said, along with Mr. Hastert, I taught ec economics for three years, and I have an advantage over the analyst because I know I don't understand economics. And I would like to have this study 
sent out to experts to see why what they're saying makes no sense to me as the soldier responsible for the interdiction campaign. Essentially, they're telling me that, you know, if you pour more resources into interdiction, uh, that you will get this mathematical relationship reducing drug use. What I was prepared to assert, and, and still do, that if we had smart operations down there that followed the drug criminals to riverine coastal delivery, because every time you do something smart, they react, that it could be a valuable adjunct to our national drug policy. And I said, get it out, send it out for study, and let's see how it stands up. Uh, neither, in my judgment, none of us uh, intended to repress or delay or whatever. And indeed, we went on, as you remember, to turn in a major request for additional funds, $250 million supplemental, which include a lot of interdiction money. It also included a 43% increase in the 97 budget for source country programs. It included a 25% increase in funding for the southwest border. And it included a 9.3% increase in overall interdiction money. So it was hardly the case that I saw a study whose magnificent logic so overwhelmed me that I persisted in not uh, supporting interdiction. I am a prime advocate of that as one contribution to this drug strategy. So the bottom line is I think uh, we've been unfair to Ida and to these three analysts by dragging them out in public on what should be a scientific debate over the validity of their work. Now, I feel the same way about the RAND study when it came out a year ago. It produced tremendous exchanges um, it did influence thinking, and I'm sure the I did study will do the same thing, and we welcome it when they finally have it done. And on that note, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad to be here, and we'll look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you, uh, General McCaffrey. Uh, let me uh, just start out uh, on page 313 of your uh, National Drug Control Strategy. Uh, just refer you to the interdiction section which uh, I guess is a, is a, shows a high of uh, two billion plus in 1991, uh, 1.960 in 1992, 1.511 in 1993, 1.311 in 1994, 1.280 in 1995, 1.339 in 1996, uh, and and I guess I guess my concern as I did my wrap-up comments of the last panel, um, I'm, I'm just worried that we may have lost a year here um, as we are questioning whether we're doing the right thing. Are we doing the right mix? Are we putting the right resources in the right areas? Are we uh, putting too much reliance on treatment of hardcore addicts and not enough on source country programs? And if I take you down to the lower piece in the international, um, in 1991, it's 633 um, million. In 1992, 660. In 1993, 523. 1994, 329. 1995, 295. And and so I, I guess my my concern here is is that as we are in the process of putting 1996 plan together, um, and we're we're looking at the appropriations for 1997. Um, and, and I'm just worried that someone in your uh, position, and certainly in our position, because we want the same information, we want to know, are we right about trying to push and beef up a little bit on interdiction? Certainly our trip verified the fact that with a little bit more, we could do so much more. And I think you agreed with that when we came back. And so I just think that it's valuable inf information that we've been denied, if in fact we were denied it. I would like to have the uh, re re recorder or reporter uh, play back one phrase or two from the previous panel uh, and then have you respond to that. Okay. The, the part that not a word of this is to get out. Well, I can't I'd hear be you. Glad to Let me just, I'd, I'd like her to just to play it, was. let her just play it back. It's, it's the clinger statement. I thought you would talk to her. 
Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to. Well, let me let me just let me, I, what I'd like to do. I guess you switch recorders in the meantime. So, uh, can you get that statement? Okay, we'll we'll uh, we'll move on from that then. And uh, uh, if you could pull that together, and uh, I I think what generally was said uh, that. Uh, not a word of this is to get out. Uh, there apparently uh, there was some rather heated discussion between you and and uh, Admiral Kramick relative to either whether you wanted to see this, the rest of this report, or whether you did want to hear the report, whether you didn't want to hear the report. Um, can you just bring us up to date as how you remember that whole situation as it took place, um, and and just. Uh, just help us a little bit, guide us through the process. Yes, sir. I'd be glad to. The, um, um, I don't believe there's any truth that any language was used, not a word of this to get out. I think, indeed, it was supposed to get out to be widely reviewed by other scientific authorities. Uh, I believe the report has been going on long before I got there. I believe the report first came up to ONDCP sometime in January. Uh, I don't know how I'd characterize how it was received. I think it had been going on earlier in the preceding year. Um, we, I were, was, we were told, I guess, it was March, but... Uh, March of... This year. Well, no, it, the first time it came up to ONDCP was in January, three, a couple, several months before I uh, was sworn in. Uh, then the, next, the first time I heard it was when uh, Admiral Kramick and Boyer briefed me on it. Now, uh, did you hear the whole report? Well, the whole report, I got a briefing out of Boyer and briefing? Kramick, and okay. pretty good briefing. They're smart guys. They know all about the business. Uh, uh, they laid out the thinking. Uh, I didn't like it. Uh, I, it seemed to me then and now that it was uh, too much of a stretch to go from laser strike, which I was running, and green clover, to driving up prices of cocaine and demand down. So I said, that doesn't make any sense. And in addition, um, I was aware that um, there really hadn't been any change in prices in cocaine in America. Use, w price wasn't up. Demand wasn't down. So I said, you're giving us way too much credit. What we can do in interdiction on the air bridge, and we're doing quite successfully, is we can make them react to us, go to a different form of smuggling, penetrate their systems with our intelligence while they do it, and drive up the, the tactical cost of delivery. That's what I thought we were doing. So you feel that that whole report was, used the words that were given to you, utter nonsense, oh, garbage. You know, I wish, I'd used, I wish I'd used more moderate language. Um, you know, I, I retract that. I think these are bright guys. It has value to hear other viewpoints. It certainly didn't ring too well with the scientific community when they saw it. I, l let's let me see. ask you this. Uh, do, you f do you agree with the substance of the report? No, not at all. Not I th at, and nothing in the report at all? No, no, wait. I think what I would agree with is that good interdiction pays off and that if you can get beyond air bridge operations, and General West Clark now is moving into riverine, coastal, uh, and if we can get more effective support for Peruvian police and, and army, and if we can do alternative development better, then we will make a substantial contribution, and that will eventually affect drug use in America. Well, how would you describe the interdiction efforts that were taking place prior to 93, up through 92? Uh, you, uh, let's say just for the three or four years, uh, were, were they effective? Oh, yeah. No, I think there was some brilliant work done in the, uh, by President Bush and, and the administration in responding to the, the initial threat, which was uh, essentially drugs coming from Peru and and Bolivia to Colombia and then directly into South Florida, Louisiana, Texas. Uh, they got their act organized. Uh, they, they put a lot of machinery out in the Caribbean uh, and it worked. And it Did we learn anything from the fact when we stopped it and gutted that program? Did we learn anything from the fact that it may have been premature? Well, 
uh, of course we always do. Uh, but I guess what I tell you is the threat changed. There was no drop in cocaine coming in America at all through that. It just moved to Mexico. And it kept coming, and purity and, and availability and price got worse, not better. Now, now, having said that, I do not mean to imply it was useless. It wasn't useless. It, it, one thing it did was it kept democratic governments in office in Latin America. Secondly, it stripped off hundreds of tons of cocaine. Uh, third, there was a principle involved that we owe the American people a defense of our children. So it was a brilliant effort. It caused them to respond, and now we've got to respond to their new patterns of smuggling and criminal behavior. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General McCaffrey, uh, welcome. Um, I was just looking at some testimony that you gave uh, back on September the 19th, and um, uh, during a uh, hearing uh, entitled Heroin, a Reemerging Threat. You remember that before this uh, committee? Uh, you may not yes. remember. You, you, heroin, yes. Probably yeah. heroin, mm -hmm. that's right. Absolutely. Um, and um, during that, on page 87, uh, lines 2009, uh, you commented on this, uh, all of what we're talking about today. Uh, this report, I think, is a response to one of Mr. Micah's questions. Um, and you said, in part, you said, but the study, and I quote, but the study seemed to imply that the interdiction campaign that I had run had achieved phenomenal successes in driving up the price of heroin and cocaine and reducing consumption. Personally, I found those conclusions utter nonsense, and so I asked them to be submitted in more of a scientific analytical process which is what I think is happening now. Is that, is that, would that be accurate? Do you recall that? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair statement. Is that the same thing you're saying today? Yes, sir. Um, you know, Mr. Constantine, whose judgment I rely on a lot as a straight-talking cop, uh, we didn't think the price of cocaine was going up in America because of our very successful interdiction operations. What we thought we were doing, we were killing criminals, we, the Peruvian Air Force and the Colombians, we were doing great eradication work, uh, and we were putting up a spirited defense, which was causing them to change to a less effective smuggling system by river and by coastal freighter. And that's what they're trying to do right now. You, uh, in, in answering uh, the uh, chairman's uh, questions a few minutes ago, um, you talked about this, re this report, and you, I think you basically are, were saying that you felt like it was a, a, an honest effort. Um, I'm going to quote again from uh, that September 19th uh, hearing uh, transcript and at page 87, uh, line starting at line, uh, I was, I'll start at line 2024. I'm just wondering if you recall this testimony back on September 19th. It's, and Mr. Michael asked you the question, this was, a criti this, this was critical of the first two years of the administration. And in fact, did you try, you don't think you then tried to repress making that report public? And this is your response at line uh, 2027. No, I don't think so. I think our attempt ought to be to apply, to, to apply cold, hard logic, to apply cold, hard logic. And I interpreted that study to be honest as more. I interpreted that study to be an apology for increased machinery out in the Caribbean as opposed to confronting the drug issue. Do you recall saying that? Uh, yes, I do. And let me put it in context. The last thing I want to do as a fellow who believes in interdiction is to go out in the street with a study that is immediately subject to attack as being a rented piece of paper uh, that's supporting my position. Now, I, I don't think that's what Ida was doing, but that was my concern, that I appear with a piece of paper that wouldn't withstand scrutiny. And uh, that's why I still feel about it. General McCaffrey, there have been some statements that have made from this bar, and I call it a bar, it gets us this table, um, about you. And I want to say, you know, since you didn't have a chance to defend yourself, I, I just want you to respond. Um, once again, for the record, did you ever instruct Admiral Kramick or anyone to bury the draft interdiction, <coughs> interdiction report by the IDA? No. You never did? No. And you understand that you, you are sworn to tell the truth? I certainly do. Now, do you personally have any evidence the price of cocaine on American streets is skyrocketing because of your efforts during your tenure? No, at too Stockholm? bad. 
No, too bad it, it hasn't. That does not imply that our efforts didn't provide a tremendous boost to uh, the counter drug effort. It just didn't. What it did affect was the price of moving the drug. Uh, it killed some criminals and put a bunch of them in jail. It locked up most of the Kali drug cartel. Uh, it started a tremendous eradication program in Colombia, and it, it, and it was a, a substantial contribution at the risk of life of a bunch of Air Force, Army, Navy, Coast Guard, agency, and other personnel. That's what we were doing. Did you ever intimidate, to your knowledge, uh, issue any kind of instructions that might be viewed as intimidation with regard to this report to anyone? Uh, Admiral Kramick's pretty hard to intimidate. I don't think so. As a matter of fact, back on September 19th, you said that you had the utmost respect for uh, Admiral Kramick, did you not? I think he's one of the finest people I've met in government service and frequently the voice of reason in this whole process over the last three years that I've been working with him. As a matter of fact, I direct your attention to our Septem September 19, 19, 19, 1996 um, transcript from that September 19th uh, hearing. And uh, in response to one of Mr. Micah's questions, you, in commenting on, uh, on uh, uh, Bob Kramick, you said, Mr. Congressman, I don't, and I meant uh, 2684, line 2684, um, Mr. Congressman, I don't know. I believe Bob Kramick, who is probably one of the smartest, most able people in Washington, D.C., I deal with, I, be I, I believe he did as, as the interdiction coordinator. You still believe, I guess the, the part of that that I'm most concerned about is the whole thing that you believe in his integrity and, and, and his brilliance. Is that right? Absolutely. And you, still, and you still hold that opinion? Yep. When, uh, when, we had, when we had the notion of an interdiction coordinator and the commandant of the Coast Guard uh, was selected, there was a collective sigh of relief all over the uh, system because we trust the Coast Guard and we respected Admiral Kramick. One last question, I think. General McCaffrey, can you please tell the subcommittee what the administration's position on interdiction is? Does not the administration believe that interdiction is an important component in stopping the use of illegal drugs in the United States? It is a vital component, and indeed it deserves probably even more resources in the years to come if we can intelligently apply them to the task and understand that these are tactical efforts that must be part of a coherent national strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Klinger. morning uh, that would appear to be in conflict uh, with uh, some of the uh, statements that you've made here this afternoon. And I just want to try and clarify those inconsistencies and if there are, uh, give you an opportunity at least to respond to Certainly. them. Certainly. Uh, we had indication, that you indicated that you, your briefing on this report was basically by Admiral Kramick and uh, I guess he was the one who you discussed this with. Uh, the question I have is, did you, as has been indicated, uh, refuse a briefing by the authors of the report uh, after knowing the, of the conclusions of the study? In other words, you, you had apparently been briefed on the conclusions. The suggestion is that you were unwilling uh, to meet with the people who actually wrote the report. In other words, you're getting secondhand uh, impression of the report. Did you refuse to meet with them? Yes, sir. Well, uh let me just tell you that uh, Captain Boyer talked through the briefing uh, using slides. Uh, Kramick and I had a discussion of it. Um, and I think I used words to the effect that I didn't have time to wallow around in another hour of it, get it out for scientific review. I sort of think that's what I said. Which, in, which implied then that you didn't have the time to really meet with the, or, to, or discuss the matter with the authors of the report. That's correct. Uh, Finally, I think this, you've been asked this a couple of ways, but the, the exact words we understood, I don't think you've been asked this, did you ever say to Admiral Kramick expressly, as others have testified uh, under oath this morning, that, quote, not a word of this study is to get out? That would imply that I had never existed in Washington, D.C., Mr. Klinger. I don't know of a report that doesn't get out. That is I true. sent I sent the report out all over the country to Harvard, Maryland, Rand Corporation, etc. So you're saying basically no, you never said that's that. correct. That's right. Now, 
Obviously, my main interest in this is, uh, from the vantage point of the chairman of the full committee, having to do with oversight of the government as a, as a whole. And would you agree that, that this report, and in the form in which it was, was presented, would have been appropriate for the Congress, this committee or the Congress, to have in making deliberations in terms of resource allocation on the war on drugs. I mean, it, it presented a conflicting point of view to the report that was relied upon by the administration in making the requests, as I understand it, for resources. But I think that, would you agree that we should have had access to a, to a contrary suggestion that the uh, resource allocation was skewed, that in fact the emphasis was being given to the wrong side of the equation? Well, Mr. Klinger, I would uh, agree with one thing. There is nothing in ONDCP now or in the future to which I will not give Congress ready access. There is no information that you shouldn't have access to. The real question is... We can only get it if we know that it exists. Well, the, the real we question know. is, should I give you something, a work in progress, a draft report that I hear for 10 minutes and to which I do not agree as one of the experts on interdiction, even though I support interdiction, should I have sent this over saying, I don't agree with this thing, it's out for scientific review, but I wanted you to get it right away? I don't know. I'll, I'll do whatever uh, is in Congress' uh, best interest. But the, the quick answer is no. I don't agree with the report then, and when I finally get it, I'll take it into account, and if I don't agree with it, you will, will get to express your views to me since you own the purse. Okay, so your view is then that it, it could only be made available to us even though it was going to come after the fact in terms of the, of the, of the use we might make of it, if it was in a final, uh, final report and it had been uh, studied again. It had been studied for a year and a half. Yeah. But, Mr. Klinger, I don't know that anybody would ever keep this from you anyway. It's an unclassified study. And, you know, I would, our doors are open to you and your committee and your staffers to go look at anything we're doing because I also learn a lot from, uh, from dealing with you all. So... I don't, uh, I don't have a bit of problem with you having access to any documents over there, but I don't agree with this one yet. All right. Now, you know, you can understand there's a, a bit of skepticism on our part here because when you came into the office, you indicated you were going to produce a, drug, a new drug strategy uh, within six months. This report was available to you shortly after you came in. It, in fact, does basically repudiate or at least seriously question uh, the previous three drug strategies that have been pursued by this administration. Uh, so you can understand our skepticism that perhaps the motivation for this was in fact to substantiate what was going on and which you ultimately did uh, and was undercutting uh, what the administration had been pursuing for the previous three years, which apparently was a failed policy. Well, Mr. Klinger, this report, if I completely agreed with it, would have been a wonderful bouquet for me personally to add to that strategy. This does not refute the strategy. It supports it. I think it's a weak read, and so I'm a little careful about going out and waving that uh, document and saying, for that reason, give me goal four and five dollars. It does, however... Uh take on, head on, uh, the RAND study. I mean, it really is very critical and very uh, uh, condemnatory, if you will, of the, of the RAND study. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, with, and, and you sort of reject, think the RAND study was accurate in all respects, and that this... No, no, wait. Not. I haven't talked about the RAND study, Mr. Kleiner. I don't really, to be honest, think that's an enormous contribution to the policy process either. What I believe is that you must, as a first priority, have young Americans reject illegal drugs. Secondly, you've got to go to the addicted population, 3.6 million, of whom many are in the criminal justice system, and provide effective treatment. And then, in addition, you've got to go out and defend America's air, land, and sea frontiers and work with our democratic allies. So I am, uh, I am fully supportive of this balanced strategy. And the RAND study, and again, I say this as an undergraduate engineer, not physicist, didn't lend itself to that dialogue either. It implied you could ignore interdiction and go work the treatment. I don't, I don't think that's sensible either. Let me just say in conclusion, uh, you know, you've talked about cooperation, and I think there's been very good cooperation between your office and this committee uh, over the last two years under Chairman Zellis' leadership and so forth. 
my concern and my disappointment was that this appeared to me at least, and I think to others, that there was an element of suppression here which would belie uh, the stated goals of cooperation. I think if we don't have access to all of the information that we need to make these kinds of judgments, then that is not uh, cooperation. So to that extent, I would just express my disappointment that that cooperation, in my view, broke down on this issue. Well, I, I respect your viewpoint. I'm sensitive to it, and I'll try and work harder to maintain uh, your confidence. Mr. Hastert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just set the record straight, uh, General. I think one of uh, your first meeting with me, I think, was in March or late February of last year. Uh, really was an inspiration to me to get involved in this whole drug interdiction process. And uh, I've had a lot of hats in this uh, uh, Congress, as Chief Deputy Whip, and lining up votes and doing health care, and sometimes I didn't need an extra job. But I took that on because I thought we were very sincere in our discussion. It was a breakfast that uh, Mr. Zeloff hosted, if I remember right. Now, one of the things that after our discussion and after a subsequent trip, I guess I'd be what Mr. Micah might call a Johnny come lightly uh, in this issue, but I did uh, get involved at the speaker's requ request because we wanted to do the right thing. And a lot of the trends that we talked about were certainly trends that were set long before you became the drug czar, so to speak. As a matter of fact, you were doing duty down in Southcom and the Southern Command and uh, I think doing some excellent work. But one of the things that I tried to do after the trip, after my uh, uh, discussion with uh, people like uh, the president of uh, Peru and the folks that we have on the ground in Bolivia and uh, our folks in DEA and other intelligence areas uh, in uh, Colombia and working with people and uh, talking to people in Panama and then also the government of Mexico, I really started to understand the real frustrations that this is an easy, isn't an easy process. It's a process that's uh, pockmarked with politics, uh, international politics, as well as internal politics. And one of the things when you talk to me, uh, being able to go out and bolster the appropriation process and the job that the speaker asked me to do, I took a lot of your information. I think in most cases we were pretty successful. But one of the frustrations I had when I went to a subcommittee chairman on appropriations and he sanctimoniously waved the RAND study in my face and says, well, you guys are all wrong about interdiction. It doesn't make any difference at all. We need to put the money someplace else so we're going to gut the Coast Guard. That was wrong. And I was looking for something. I guess sometimes we all look for something to, to bolster our views on what's right and what's wrong. Uh, to counter the RAND study, quite frankly. When I saw this, I was interested, and most interested. Uh, would you uh, give the uh, general a copy of this, something we were just handed out and something I'd looked at before? The people who wrote this weren't economists. Uh, the gentleman who wrote this was like a physicist. What? They weren't economists. Was like not you economist. And it was not an economist. Didn't have the degrees that you or I might have in e economics. But they were, well, the gentleman that was a physicist. I guess a physicist looks at, you know, cause and effect, uh, effect and the uh, tree, apples falling out of trees and things like that. This shows cause and effect. And uh, it, 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 it's very striking, I think. See, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree that it shows cause and effect at all. Well, this shows correlation. That's different. Let's agree that we don't disagree. <laughs> All right. But I mean, it's important to understand that, you know, that there's a, it's just like right. the relationship between smoking marijuana and cocaine addiction. There's a tremendous statistical correlation, but no necessary cause. Anyway, effect. what happened in this is that uh, price went up and purity, or price went down and purity went up, you know, and, and the whole correlation in that. So if you want to use the word correlation, that happened. Now, that's significant, uh, but the real concern that I have in, in the record of the predecessor that you had was very different from when I uh, sat on this panel and this committee 10 years ago and worked with Admiral Yost in the, in the Coast Guard and worked with a, a drug czar and another administration that 
that made a difference. I mean, those efforts really started to choke down. You were a part of that. Choked down. Uh, they were successful in interdiction. It did start to drive down the use of uh, uh, drugs in this country. And one of the, th the reasons, I, th I think, uh, I don't have any empirical evidence to show that, but drug use was cut down during those uh, early, uh, late years in uh, the 80s and early years in the 90s. And all of a sudden, when there was $500 million that were transferred out of interdiction before you ever became, uh, had the job you did, and was supposed to be a real shift between interdiction and source country, and the shift never happened, those dollars never went in. And then we saw the results of a huge increase in drug use, especially among teenagers. Okay, there, who are, now, to be fair though, uh, sir, there has not been a huge increase in drug use nor did any of these drive up the seizure rates of cocaine over the years. See, that's the problem. The increase among teenage drug use, which is almost completely marijuana and other products, not cocaine, not heroin, did not respond to any of this interdiction effort. Oh. I, I say that just as a scientific observer and a participant in the process. Well, our sources say there was heroin, and heroin's coming back, but the other part of it was right that the stigma on heroin was uh, people using needles. Kids yeah. didn't want to use needles. No, I so agree. I, I just meant came... that chart on cocaine. We, we got almost the same amount year after year. That's frustrating to those of us who are working the interdiction community, and we're going to go work it smarter in the next several years. But year after year, we got the cocaine coming into America stayed about the same. And thank God the number of people using it dropped dramatically, 75% in the last 15 years. They're sticking about 300 tons up their nose still, or using crack products. We didn't affect drug abuse in America through the interdiction campaign. That doesn't mean it wasn't a, a tremendously valuable effort. Well, I mean, we have evidence, and we can talk about evidence, empirical evidence going back and forth, but there are things that show that uh, 1993 uh, drug abuse uh, uh, did start to go up. Emergency rooms did take in more. Emergency uh, rooms uh, does not relate to drug use. It uh, does when you start to take kids who are, or, or use drugs and are OD'd because the purity of drugs are a lot higher than they thought it was. So I don't want to argue back and forth. Mm -hmm. my, my point is, is that this point forward, we need to work together. Yes, sir. And I think uh, <clears throat> many of us uh, have taken a good first step. I mean, I've worked diligently to make sure that your request, the kind of a unique situation that I had, uh, were filled. And that, in fact, uh, you have another $60 million at your discretion. Because I think you need some money at your discretion. Now, I'd certainly be interested as soon as you'd be able to swallow everything that happened and they digest it, where that money's going to go and what, yeah. you know, how you think that discretionary fund should be spent. Uh, so there, there is, in my view, cause and effect. I think we need to put our money in good causes. We need to spend it intelligently. As a matter of fact, when we use that word, sometimes I think maybe intelligence. There's not enough intelligence, and the more money we put intelligent, in intelligence mm -hmm. to know where that money, that product comes from, how it's moved through the channel, and being able to intercept it is, is tied to intelligence. And we probably don't put enough emphasis on that. I agree. And uh, how we can best set up a strategy so that when we come into 1998, and I, I understand you were caught in the switches for the 97 budget, and I sympathize with the situation. You came in, uh, a lot of transition going on in the, in the House, and in some cases the Senate had already put their budgets and their appropriations to bed before you ever had a chance to get involved. But we have turned that around. I think you've gotten everything that you've, almost everything that you've needed to do that, including your staff that you needed to do. Now, we want to see how best we can fight this. I think interdiction is a very important part of this thing. I, I think agree. source country is a very important part of this. Now, I may be proved wrong, and we can throw statistics around to, th to prove it. I think this is a starting point that we need to work together. And I think it's unfortunate uh, that this happens, uh, a misunderstanding of what you said and what feelings are and why things were suppressed or why things weren't suppressed.
But I think from this point on, we need to work together. I think we need to about get serious about doing that. And uh, I can tell you, as long as I'm around here and I can affect some of this legislation, you know, I'm there to bat for you. Yes, but we've got to have the right information. We've got to be able to listen to all things and uh, hopefully build upon what knowledge we have. And uh, I so have always been uncomfortable with the RAND situation because, as you said, you can put uh, all kinds of economic models together, but models don't always tell what the effects are properly. And uh, to rely on one study, which really makes policy, it's driven the policy of the previous drug czar. And uh, to say that's right and something else doesn't even belong in the mix, I think is wrong. I hope we can work together to rectify that. I'd welcome that. The gentleman yield just for a quick minute. Um, we, uh, for the past two years, we have been, long before you arrived on the scene, we have been critical on the subcommittee of, of the lack of interdiction efforts, the major cuts in interdiction, the major cuts in source country programs. Uh, we came back after going down and taking a look at it firsthand. We were then totally convinced that the policy was wrong. We came back and tried to influence changes with you, but the, I think the strategy was already set, and that's no fault of yours. It, would, it was moving before you even got there. In spite of that, we gave you the resources. We fought like the devil to get, make sure that your office was funded. You'll remember that. Uh, so that you could start putting together the right policies. And so I'd like to say to you, this subcommittee here, uh, is greatly concerned about the fact that we are using bad data, RAND data, to, to drive the uh, treatment, uh, the 2.9 billion, I believe, of treatment monies that we now have in, the, in, in, 90, in, uh, in 1997 appropriations bill. Uh, and, and we were fighting to patch up and boost up uh, monies for the Coast Guard in other areas. Let me just ask you this question. Uh, you know, uh, are we on the right track? Are, are you in agreement? Uh, are you willing to sit down with the subcommittee? Are we willing to start? If, if IDA doesn't work, then what other information is out there? Are we going to, you know, we don't want to reject uh, information for the sake of rejecting it, but maybe we need to get information that people believe in. Uh, maybe we ought to check with an independent source while IDA knows what they're talking about. But bottom line here is, is that We've got kids dying on the streets, and we need to somehow figure out what is the right balance. And again, it's a, it's a five-legged stool. It's, it's, it's education, prevention, treatment, uh, interdiction, and source country programs. If you pull one leg of the stool, the stool caves in. Comments? Well, I, I think the way you put that concept together, I support what you said. You talked about a balanced strategy. I couldn't agree more. The one caution I would add, sir, if I may, is that in my criticism of the RAND Corporation study's impact on policy analysis did not mean to imply that I don't uh, absolutely believe uh, that we must provide effective treatment programs for those who are addicted. If we want to stop crime and violence in America, we have got to do things like break the cycle, the drug courts. We've got to go to Baltimore, Miami, rural Iowa, San Diego, and get the, uh, those who are addicted, who, the 2.1 million Americans who consume 80% of the drugs in America, and two-thirds of them are involved in the criminal justice system in a given year. We simply must pay the cost to provide drug treatment and follow-on care. As a taxpayer, it makes sense. And but so, we have to also look at the effectiveness of that drug, absolutely. Those drug treatment program. No, so agree. far, we're not seeming to make a dent in it, in spite of the fact that we've invested major resources. Yes, and the yeah. chart's right here on page 15. Very though, and, and on that statement that you make, you know, I, I think you have to treat those people who are drug addicts and who are hooked. But we need to be able to take that marginal stuff off the street where a kid wants to experiment and it's cheap, and it's there, and why not try it? If we, can, if we can remove that, because those are the kids in my district, in Aurora, Illinois, and Elgin, Illinois, who we have you know, some of the biggest drug kingpins right there, as close to Chicago, and you know, the, the heat's not out there. And in Northern Illinois University at DeKalb, where kids that can be delivered easy from Chicago, or Aurora, or Elgin, and they're the ones who are the experimenting. And if this, it's there, and it's cheap, and it's available, they're the ones who are 
experimental recreational users, if you will, if that's such a thing, but they get hooked. And let's stop that from happening. M Mr. Hastert, you are exactly right. That's why interdiction, whether or not it changes the price of the purity, is so vital to America. Because if we take 100 tons out of the school systems in the cities, less kids are going to fool around with drugs. And there's an algorithm there, known but to God, in which some number get addicted. So I, I couldn't agree with your point more. I think you're entirely correct. That's law enforcement as well as interdiction. I'm going to throw in one quick comment because I was trying to finish this before. But if you look at this chart here, this is the uh, number of people being treated. It's going down. This is the number, the cost, inflation adjusted of the, the monies and resources going into treatment. So the amount of money that we put into treatment is not necessarily working. And so that's got to be looked at as well. Yes, sir. Mr. Micah from Florida. General, you've been involved in this uh, drug war for some time, and uh, I too have been involved in it. I came as a staffer in the Senate in 1980 with Senator Hawkins when our state, Florida, was ravaged by uh, a dr drug war on our streets, literally. And uh, as a staffer, I helped write uh, some of the legislation that we work under now, the uh, uh, certification language I drafted, uh, came up with uh, putting some of the resources into interdiction and source countries, uh, trying to make sure that we approach this problem from education, treatment, interdiction, and enforcement standpoint. Uh, when I came to Congress, I was still concerned about it, and not many people were talking about it uh, in 92 or 93. And be glad to get the record and show you the statements I made trying to get even one hearing in this uh, committee. And when you were, well, your predecessor, I wasn't very pleased with his performance uh, or the administration's policy because it didn't take much. I didn't, I don't have a science degree. I'm not an economist uh, like you or whatever background you had. Uh, but. Uh, Sir, could, I looked could at, you pull that microphone over? I'm half I looked at the I'm, I looked at the results, uh, and when you see that we cut uh, interdiction, that through the RAND study or through whatever study we put our resources on treatment, sort of treating just the wounded in the battle, a tremendous em uh, emphasis on that and away from some of the other. Uh, uh, emphasis that I felt were necessary, including uh, some in transit zone and even more in source countries, and they weren't done under the last Congress or under this administration. Uh, then, I, I think when I, you were appointed, I was one of the first to offer my assistance on this panel to get you whatever resources. We went to South America, some of us. Uh, spent time away from our families. It was uh, not where you, one of these uh, trips where everybody uh, takes their spouse along. We went into the jungles. We talked to DEA agents on the ground. We tried to learn what was happening. And then we came back. We got the speaker to, uh, to provide some leadership. Mr. Hastrick joined us. And it became a project of this new uh, Congress. Um, I'm, I'm telling you that because then, and, and working the last few weeks to get the legislation through, to put the funds in here, to restore these things that had been cut out and some of the emphasis that had been cut out, I heard from your people around you that, I, that there was a report uh, that wasn't coming out. I heard that the report had been presented some time ago and wasn't coming out, was getting, for lack of a better term, buried. I, I wasn't a happy person. I, I asked you about some of those com, uh, questions I had, and I felt this deserved an airing because uh, this, this is a critical report. And even today, you said, I don't agree with this study yet, I think was your comment just a few minutes ago. I tried to take it down. 
Well, we're trying to make decisions in a time when there are very limited resources here. We're up to hock to our, in our, to our eyeballs, and we're trying to decide between programs of importance to the country without driving it further into debt. So our purpose is to get the best information, for you to share that information uh, with us, uh, and that we have that in a timely fashion to make those decisions on behalf of the citizens we represent. You could almost predict the, the headlines that I uh, held up here today, uh, basically because uh, we have stopped uh, interdiction, because we stopped some of the source uh, country programs, uh, because we haven't put a proper emphasis in all of the uh, areas necessary. And also, most importantly, we haven't provided the leadership from the White House. Your predecessor didn't provide the leadership. The uh, highest chief uh, health officer of this country didn't provide the leadership, uh, uh, who made a joke out of uh, legalization. And, and I submit even the president in his statements on MTV uh, uh, and saying that uh, he would have inhaled if he had it to do over again doesn't meet goal one, motivate America's youth to reject illegal drugs and substance abuse. So that's my comment. Uh, my question, and, and I don't want to, I'm not going to get into who said what to whom. Some of that has been charged already. Uh, uh, my, my question is, um, do you believe that we uh, can work together, that we can um, uh, find some solutions, that your office can be open with uh, this committee and uh, our subcommittee and uh, see if we can't work together to, to put our limited resources most effectively where they can do the, the best uh, job? I'd welcome that opportunity. I would indeed. Uh, finally, uh, I think it's important that uh, as we develop this drug strategy and uh, also uh, direct the limited resources of this uh, Congress and, and the American people, we do it in the most effective uh, manner. Uh, do you have uh, further recommendations and in what uh, order or sequence will they be, be provided to this Congress and the subcommittee so we can pick up from where we've left off uh, and what, and the, uh, in providing you the assets uh, that you need to do the job? Um, Mr. Congressman, I need to write an intelligent 1998 budget request uh, uh, w in full cooperation with the 14 other cabinet officers who are involved in this. That's step number one. Then I have to devise a five-year budget concept and then submit it to the President and the Cabinet and get it down here and see what you all think about it. If I don't do that, we will never break out of the kind of uh, exchanges we're now having. And that's what I dedicate myself to doing between now and next summer. I thank you. I think my time's expired. Uh, you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I should add, if I may be fair, one other comment. As you know, the 1988 law establishing my position uh, states that I am a, a political officer of the government. The Attorney General and I are not to take part in electoral politics. I've been a soldier since I was 17 years old. Uh, I took this job, and I am honored to be part of it. Now, having said that, you should be uh, aware uh, that I have been working with this president for the last three years and with the team, Janet Reno, Donna Shalala, Bill Perry, uh, the CIA, and others, and, I, and Admiral Kramick and Tom Constantine and Louis Free. And I should, you should understand, and I don't say this in rebuttal to Mr. Micah, but merely to put on the table my absolute respect for their corporate leadership and my belief that they are committed to a non-drugged, non-stoned America. General, I, I, I can appreciate that, and, and I certainly would agree uh, in some degree. Um, I'm just concerned. We are concerned about some information here that's been under oath, you know, there's, that are in conflict, and we're going to have to discuss that. Um, and I think the other piece that I'd like to just, there's a letter that apparently 
written in the Wall Street Journal. There's a letter from uh, Administrator Louis Free from the FBI and Tom Constantine, who I also, both th those gentlemen I have tremendous respect for, uh, talking about our national drug strategy as a drift. And are you aware of that letter? And uh, could you kind of describe what, what the contents of that letter would be? I have no knowledge at all about the letter except what I've read in the press and I heard in the scuttlebutt. Okay, well, we've asked the President for a copy of it, and we've been told that uh, he invoked uh, executive privilege. Uh, in Prior that to my watch, and I don't have any involvement in it. Um, relative to the degree of what's happening in the drug war today to America, I'd just like to read you uh, from some of the testimony we've had in our previous hearings. Um, and this relates to drug emergencies at record level. As indicated earlier, another critical indication that cuts in interdiction are having a negative impact on use and purity of available drugs is alarming new data and drug-related emergencies. Increasing drug-related medical emergencies first became obvious in the 1993 Drug Abuse Warning Network Dawn data collected from emergency rooms around the country and released in December of 1994. That data showed an 8% increase in drug-related emergency room cases between 92 and 93 with 45% being heroin overdoses, overdoses, not just marijuana. Cocaine was also at an all-time high, having more than doubled since 1988, and marijuana emergencies increased 22% between 1992 and 1993. The Dawn data released in October of 1995 darkens the assessment. It shows that in 1994, cocaine-related episodes reached their highest level in history and registered a 15% increase from 93 and 40% increase from 1988. On top of this, marijuana or hashish-related emergencies rose 39% from 93 to 94, and total drug-related emergency cases rose 10% between 1993 and 1994. So we believe very strongly that we have, you know, in heroin-related emergencies increased between 94 and 95 by 19%. Um, we believe very strongly that we have an epidemic and, uh, and, and a crisis. Would you care to comment? Well, quite clearly, the, uh, in particular, heroin, with its very high purity and increasing availability, the worldwide production having doubled in the last 10 years, is going to represent a very fundamental threat to our uh, population. Uh, the data to which you refer, though, to put it in context, are in general driven by aging cohorts of addicts. As they get sick, they come in off the streets to emergency rooms. Uh, that's not completely true because there's an increase among youngsters also and, and new heroin uh, users. But in general, that's the 30-year-old to 40-year-old who's now dying because he's using, he or she's using crack or heroin. That's who's coming into the hospitals. Okay, one, uh, one last uh, quick question here. Um, you're familiar, I believe, with the 11 April 1996 letter from uh, Mr. Boyer. Um, and, and this is uh, to Dr. Barry Crane. And just uh, two comments. The draft paper on source zone interdiction effectiveness is an excellent step toward quantifying a very complex issue. A linkage between interdiction efforts and cocaine price fluctuation is one that we have intuitively based our supply reduction strategy upon. And it's gratifying to see that the impact can be quantified. And then the, on the second page, recommend deleting or softening any language that appears to be either combative with or condescending of the RAND study or self-promoting of IDA. Instead of taking a negative approach toward the RAND analysis, take a positive approach towards source zone efforts and let the IDA analysis speak for itself. And then uh, lastly, uh, the discussion of the cost effectiveness of treatment programs is of great value, but not necessary to the analysis of the intrinsic value of interdiction programs and possibly beyond the purview of USIC and DOD related taskings for IDA. Recommend this issue be removed from the paper and treated separately or at a minimum place in an appendix. And then written on the bottom, good work. Um, what I am hearing you say is, is that you don't believe it is good work and that you disagree with any or most of the findings. Um, wh what you said was, uh, you talked about, I've read Boyer's memo. I read it uh, two, in the last two or three days. And uh, it's a pretty balanced memo. It lays out his concerns about the study. Um, and I think he correctly, to be honest, made the point that their analysis, if they wanted to support interdiction as having value to the U.S. drug strategy, was don't contaminate it by going after the RAND study. And don't talk about its contributions, it, the interdictions campaign, to what I think is a dubious proposition that interdiction in the short run will drive up costs 
drive down use. I don't believe it. That's not what we're seeing on the streets. And since I like the IDA attempt, they ought to focus, in my view, I haven't told them this, I'm now telling them this, they ought to focus on arguing why your dollars that you're giving me this year for interdiction pay off. They ought to go find the payoffs and it'll be there. It'll be there in the increased retail costs. We've, we're seeing thousands of campesinos leave the coca fields in Peru and head into Lima. Um, there are payoffs to interdiction. I just personally think it's nonsense to say, I'm going to go down to Baltimore and find that crack prices are up and use is down. Now, if we get better at interdiction, we start taking away two-thirds of it instead of a third of it, then I, I would suspect my conclusions are incorrect. But they're welcome to study anything they want. All right. Well, my, my hope would be that if someone comes to see me and has some answers on interdiction, uh, I think we all have to be willing to have an open mind. And yes, sir. I, I believe that you said that you would. Um, in just one last comment that's really troubling me, uh, I, I've gotten back from the recorder here. Um, and you have a copy at the table, I believe. Um, Dr. Revolvo uh, and, and had indicated uh, that going back, or I guess while he was there, um, Admiral Kramer came out and told him certain things that this was not to see the light of the day. Uh, in, the, in the staff vehicle on the ride back to the Pentagon, uh, it was his understanding that until further notice, none of this was to get out. Uh, now, they didn't agree to the word suppressed or buried, but they certainly, uh, I guess they agreed to delay. Um, my problem here is, is that they have apparently gone to a meeting and have come back with some rather dramatic differences of opinion as to what happened. Uh, you've been pretty direct, but again, would you refer to this, this one statement from the recorder? And then secondly, uh, who was in the room? Was it Captain Boyer, Admiral Kramick, and McCaffrey? And did McCaffrey go out and meet with those folks, or is it all part of their imagination? And, th and I guess that's the concern that I have here as I leave this room, that we haven't resolved, apparently, a major controversy of who heard what and and, and I think it only has to do with are we willing to have an open mind and are we willing to move forward and are we willing to work together in a cooperative effort? Um, of course. Uh, I am not a politician. Uh, I am a soldier now serving in the drug policy office. Uh, I am sympathetic to these people leaving. Uh, I didn't go out and talk to them. They didn't brief me. Um, they're good people. They come from a reputable institute. They're going to have a study that contributes to our understanding of the problem. They probably left disappointed. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't like the study. I thought it was incorrect. I'm an expert on drug interdiction. But at some point, their study will help form our thinking. And I absolutely commit myself to accepting all viewpoints and to welcoming the direct involvement of Congress in this process. Uh I, I think at, at this point, uh, we, I, I would like to say what, what others have said in the past. Uh, we, you are our great hope. And uh, I've said that to you directly. I've said it publicly. Uh, we uh, have made a major commitment. I've made a major commitment. I'm leaving Congress. I came back today for this hearing. Um, I'm totally committed to what we're trying to do. Uh, it goes way beyond personalities. No one single person has all the answers, and I think you'll be the first to admit that. Uh, while we have great respect for you, uh, we are going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, we are on track and that we don't allow politics to derail this effort, because if we do, then you're then getting into my grandchildren and my kids, and I'll, I, like my good friend from Baltimore, I don't think we're going to allow that to happen. Um, again, you are our great hope, and, and uh, we are there. We've shown as recently in the last three days, give you the resources that, we can that, that, that you need to do your job. But we've got to somehow be willing to open up and be willing to take information as it comes along and, uh, and reverse strategies if we have to do that and let the chips fall where they may. Yes, sir, Mr. Micah. Open this up, but just one last question uh, to, to the general for the record. Uh, general, did you 
uh, indicate. Well, but to make a statement, that's pretty fair. I, I just wonder if the general could respond if if he did, in fact, say to uh, Admiral Kramick or to anyone else that uh, uh, not a word of this report was to get out. Um, no, and in fact, I sent the report out all over the country for review that, by but, scientific. But that was some time later. No, I don't think so. I think it was uh, sent out But at that meeting, you did not say to anyone, not a word of this, or to anyone. Uh, no. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, just, a, just a brief statement, uh, General. I guess you already know this, but you have, in my opinion, the most important job in this country. And I just want to take a moment to thank you. I have not loaned you long, but I am very, very impressed. Um, your integrity speaks volumes. And I just want to encourage you to stay on your path. I mean, I, I, I learned a lot about what happened before I got to this Congress and that you were so welcomed. And as a matter of fact, the very budget uh, that uh, this committee has supported you in regard to, I mean, shows that, that, that we do support you and what you're trying to do. Finally, let me say this, that the thing I guess I like about what you're trying to do is you're trying to hit this problem from several different areas. And I believe very strongly in interdiction. I, I really do. But I also believe very strongly in people who are addicted and trying to make them well. We've gotten, my office has gotten hundreds of calls in the last few minutes, I mean, over this course of this hearing saying, just speak up for us who are trying to get well so that we don't have to, 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 so that it won't be a problem. And so for them, for all of them, I speak for them and I thank you for taking them into consideration so that they can get better. We only have one life to live and guess what? This is it. Yes, and sir. so I really appreciate it for them. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Mr. Cummings. And, uh, Mike, Mr. Hastert, Mr. Klinger, on behalf of myself, uh, General, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate uh, very much uh, your testimony here today, and we wish you good luck in what is very justifiably a very tough assignment, probably the toughest in the United States. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I ask unanimous consent to submit all questions into the record without objection, so order. Okay, we'll move to the next panel. I'd like to welcome Admiral Robert uh, Kramick, Com Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, the United States Interdiction Coordinator. Admiral, we thank you for being here today. We appreciate your patience. It's been a uh, rather long two or three hours, I believe. If you would, uh, would you uh, stand and raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. If you could uh, summarize uh, perhaps your statement, and uh, we'll obviously accept it uh, in full for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and distinguished uh, members of the subcommittee. I certainly uh, welcome the opportunity to discuss our introduction program uh, and any questions you might have concerning the report by the Institute for Defense Analysis. <clears throat> As introduction coordinator, my responsibility is oversight and coordination of interdiction efforts in the Western Hemisphere. I've been involved with these counter-narcotics operations for over 21 years. When I first started in 1975 on the Coast Guard Curtis Gallatin, conducting Operation Buccaneer in the Caribbean and the Bahamas, much has changed in the last 21 years. Blatant landings of marijuana and cocaine on our shores are not an everyday event. Now sophisticated operations to transshipment points further from our shores uh, than to transport to the U.S. and Europe uh, challenge us every day. In 1990 and 1992, I led the effort in the transit zone, not only for the Coast Guard, but at that time I was both Dr. Bennett's interdiction coordinator in the area and then Governor Martinez's two previous drug czars before General McCaffrey. And in 1994, 
I was appointed by the President to be the interdiction coordinator and then report to the third drug czar, Dr. Brown. I'm very honored now to be able to serve General McCaffrey uh, in the same capacity. Also in 1994, Presidential Decision Directive 14 uh, was promulgated, <clears throat> which did a number of things uh, that are pertinent to our discussion today. Uh, first, it appointed me as the interdiction coordinator, and coordinate was the word used, uh, not in command and control of all the operations, but to coordinate the entire effort for inter interdicting drugs in the Western Hemisphere up to our shoreline. Uh, I was also to see if all the agencies involved in this endeavor to carry out the strategy at that time had sufficient resources to do the job. <clears throat> I was also tasked with making sure that they were deploying the resources they had properly and in the most efficient manner. And my fourth major task was to see if the strategy was working and if it wasn't, to recommend any changes to that strategy. Uh, I've done all four of those things. Uh, for the last uh, two years, uh, as you know, I've stood before this committee on more than one occasion before and met with you uh, on many occasions. Um, I'm delighted now that we have a 1996 strategy uh, presented uh, to you by General McCaffrey on many occasions, reiterated uh, in, the, in the last panel by him, uh, which encompasses all of those things, in particular goals number four and five of that particular strategy. Uh, I'm also delighted that I was able to get all of the commanders and all the agencies uh, responsible for this effort that I described to you together on at least uh, five occasions in the last two years and get all of their requirements for what needs to be done uh, to make our strategy work. Uh, the results of those requirements uh, have been incorporated in the 1996 strategy, were incorporated in the, in the President's supplemental budget to Congress in April of 1996 this year. Uh, requesting uh, resources of about $250 million uh, to further uh, progress our interests, mostly in the interdiction efforts. Uh, I, I know it's been a long history of funding. I'm, I'm also delighted this weekend that it appears that in the omnibus uh, appropriations uh, that have closed out uh, this session of Congress, uh, that much of those funds have been provided. Uh, my staff is still analyzing all that to determine exactly uh, in what pot uh, the monies were provided. But it certainly looks like most of the things that the President has asked the Congress for in support of the 1996 strategy as presented by General McCaffrey uh, will now be provided uh, commencing today, October the 1st. This is very, very important because right now there are major operations underway. Uh, the newest one, uh, which commenced this morning, uh, which is to close off all drug routes uh, to and from Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Uh, this operation called Frontier Shield commenced at 1000 this morning. Also, laser strike is underway, as you know. Operation Gateway by Customs. Uh, Caper Focus is planned. Steel Web is planned. And other major operations anticipating uh, that those funds would be provided and then also carried through uh, next year in next year's budget. I think that over the last two years, uh, the administration has greatly changed its policy in putting together the 1996 strategy, it has moved in a direction, and it's been greatly assisted by the findings of this particular committee, uh, as well as Senator Hatch's committee in the Senate, on bringing the drug problem to a great national debate again and making sure that, that we attack the problem. Now, I will say that there is no panacea, no silver bullet. Uh, we all know that. Uh, the source nation strategy, for example, is not the complete answer to interdiction, and interdiction is not the complete answer to drug patrol. Our, our control strategy provides a balanced approach, as General McCaffrey presented. As interdiction coordinator, I was cautiously optimistic by the preliminary findings of the IDA report, which show that historically specific major interdiction events 
have some correlation to excursions in domestic drug prices. My staff reviewed the first draft of this study in April. They identified some problem areas. Uh, they communi communicated those to the contractor in a letter which has uh, been sent to you on your request for information. Others I see have made similar comments, and although I haven't seen them all, I'm told that IDA has produced additional drafts that have refined the research. The draft that I commented on at the time was draft number two. I considered it at that time for it to be a work in progress. Uh, I did brief in May uh, General McCaffrey on that particular work in progress. I took IDA with me to that briefing uh, in hopes that they may be able to give the full briefing. Uh, the, the briefing that I gave uh, was sufficient for the drug czar at that time, and it was a work in progress. Uh, it had not been vetted by peer review. Uh, previous to that, I had taken it to the Interdiction Committee, the TIC is the acronym for that. Uh, the TIC advises me as the U.S. Interdiction Coordinator. It consists of the Commissioner of Customs, uh, the Administrator of the DEA, and the Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, uh, the J3 and the Pentagon on the Joint Staff, uh, the Head of the Border Patrol, the Head of the INS, uh, and others as well. Uh, upon uh, TIC's uh, review of what I presented to them, which is the same presentation I made to General McCaffrey, uh, and this review was uh, given to TIC almost two months, uh, and that was based on draft one. Uh, they advised that the data was insufficient, it needed peer review, it needed more data points, uh, and, we, and we needed to tell IDA to continue on with their study, uh, which is what we did. I would also like uh, to tell you that before I uh, uh, answer any questions that you may have, uh, that IDA does a lot uh, for the U.S. Interdiction Coordinator, which has not been reported here. This particular report in question is one small piece of their work. Uh, most of their work is classified. Uh, Barry Crane and uh, and others have probably told you that recently they've been in Panama, recently they've been all over the place, uh, because what they do for me is they provide me with information uh, on where the smugglers are going, where the maritime tracks are, where the air tracks are, what's happening in the air bridge. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of information of tracking data. The commanders use that information which is all classified, it's all based on intelligence, it's all based on sensor information, uh, to determine where we should put our emphasis on interdiction. And that has been very, very successful. Uh, all of their data is immediately turned over to the commanders and in use, and it's probably one of the most successful uh, things and pieces of intelligence we've used for interdiction uh, in the last five or six years. Uh, I would be delighted at, at future hearings and in closed section because it's all classified to show you how we use the predominance of data that's provided uh, almost on a weekly basis by IDA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my oral statement and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Thank you, Admiral. I would like to uh, just start out by saying that uh, I have a great deal of respect for you and the uniform you wear and I think you're probably one of the finest people in our military. And, uh, I don't pass that on lightly, but I, I appreciate the hard work that uh, you and you've been very responsive to this subcommittee. And I think you can understand why we're a little concerned when we have conflicting testimony under oath. You know, we're clearly, uh, and it's not as big a deal if we could just kind of solve it and go on uh, and talk about interdiction, talk about uh, some of the other great things that you're doing, things that you initiated today. Uh, but it does bother me a lot when we have people like Ida that are well respected within the Pentagon that do studies for you and others and uh, and then we can't seem to get whatever really happened there out. Uh, this is a report that took 18 months to, to develop. Uh, it's now taken seven months since then and it's still not final. Uh, I can't believe the process that we go through when we keep sending it back and you change it and you know according to you know I guess the way you want it to come out. I don't know you but I mean just the te you heard the testimony we've had this morning, and and for a person who 
basically he comes from the business community. Um, to me, you, you wonder if we're getting a good bang for a buck. By the time it get, gets revised and gets out, you know, how useful will the information be? And frankly, our big concern here is, is that were we gypped out of a resource as we were putting the 1996 strategy together, as we were putting the 1997 Are we going down the same old road, uh, or are we willing to listen and open up our minds to the fact that there's some changes? And I know you are, but um, what is very discouraging, frankly, is is that um, people swore under oath that that you know they went to a briefing that never occurred. Um, you, in turn, were were asked to do the briefing, um, and. And then you came out and had to apologize, according to their words, uh, for the fact that they weren't going to be briefing uh, General McCaffrey, and that you appeared to be, and this is not my words, it's their words, upset um, in the process of explaining to them that the briefing wasn't going to take place, and the fact that you also said that this was not to see the light of day. Now, I don't know whether they're, what motivation they have for lying, but or, or whether they did in fact lie, or maybe they misinterpreted your comments. Maybe you could clarify that a little bit for us. I'd be delighted to clarify it because I don't certainly believe anybody lied. Uh, like General McCaffrey, I've been in the armed forces for 39 years. I don't ever recall lying, and I certainly uh, would not enjoy being accused of ever doing that. I, I hope you don't take this as, I, I, I'm not accusing anybody, I'm just trying to settle with the Putting it together. I think uh, I can clarify a lot of this for you because I was there, I was in the room, I gave the briefing, I'm the one who told ID8 not to give the briefing the next day, and I can explain all of that to you and why that was so. Uh, first of all, uh, IDA had been providing very useful data for me as the USIC. Uh, they had been contracted by the Department of Defense, the Department of Defense had the funds for that. But I'm to coordinate all these 32 different agencies. Uh, so while defense contracted for the reports, we used the information. Uh, this report was not information we would normally use. I used track data. I used the intelligence data. Uh, when I put down all of their tracks on what's happening in the air bridge, uh, the warriors look at that and they say, we know what to do about that. We know how to shut those tracks down. We know how to stop the supply of coca paste going from Peru to Colombia as a result. And that was Green Clover, uh, now Operation Laser Strike. And this report that they put together first came to my attention because they gave me an oral brief of data that they were finding on major operations that, in their opinion, had caused effect in price and purity and demand uh, in December. And they said they would be ready to make a better presentation in January. Uh, and on the 11th of January, uh, IDA, uh, 11th of January 1996, IDA gave me a brief uh, that showed some of the graphs uh, that are in the current version of their report, some very similar to that. Uh, that was very, very dramatic data. Uh, and I, my entire USIC staff consists of five people. Uh, I don't have any analysts uh, or any assistants that can analyze that, uh, but I have a very, very uh, experienced committee, the Introduction Committee, TIC, that I explained to you before, which advises me. And I called the first and only emergency meeting of TIC that I ever know of. Uh, they responded, and on the 17th of January, uh, met in my briefing room in Coast Guard headquarters, where I presented the IDA report and all of those charts to TIC. Uh, their total consensus of opinion was uh, the data was preliminary. Uh, there were lots of questions by DEA that it really reflected uh, what, was, uh, what was going on. There were only a couple of data points on Operation Green Clover, which had terminated on the 15th of December, just one month before. Uh, we were anxious to get on and go to sustained operations to see uh, if, in fact, uh, this, uh, this data uh, would continue to show the trends that IDA predicted. Uh, and the Department of Defense uh, representatives uh, who contracted for the report had not given it any review. This was preliminary data, preliminary information. Did you ever say at the end of this meeting, 
not a word of this to get out? That was in January. In April, I was uh, given draft number two on the 4th of April. Uh, I then made a written comment, Gary Boria, my executive director, uh, the, uh, when we provided you for that information, made a written critique of that particular report that IDA put together. The next month, I held a United States Interdiction Coordinator uh, Joint Staff Planning Conference in the Pentagon where all the commanders came into town. <clears throat> On the first day of that conference, IDA briefed that report to all of the commanders. Uh, that was the same day that I briefed, uh, that was in the morning. In the afternoon, uh, it was my first briefing to the new drug czar. Uh, once every other month, I sit down with General McCaffrey and give him a brief and a status report of everything that's going on in the introduction community. <clears throat> As part of that briefing, one item of perhaps eight or nine that I briefed him on uh, was the status of the IDA report. I told him I had the analysts uh, out in his outer lobby. Uh, if he had the time to receive the full report, he said, will you brief me now? Tell me what this report is about. I gave him a quick briefing. He said, uh, does it have peer review? I said, no. He said, it doesn't agree with my understanding of things like supply and demand and, and the economics. Uh, I told him that I had vetted the same briefing through the introduction committee. Uh, they had the same, exact same uh, opinion of the report as he did. He said it needed peer review. We needed to have peer review. Uh, and he didn't want to receive the full report until it was a final report delivered to the sponsor, Department of Defense, and had gotten proper peer review. I then left, went out into the hallway on the way out, uh, told Barry Crane, I'm very sorry, you won't be able to present this today. Uh, it's preliminary. It's, it's not ready for prime time, I think I told him. Uh, Is that the and same it, thing and it needs to be reviewed. But did you or did you not say that not a word of this is to get out? No. What I told him was the USIC Commanders Conference that I hold on a quarterly basis uh, is always a two-day meeting. The first day, the working groups meet together. The second day, the principals meet. Uh, Barry Crane's group had already presented this information to the working group. I told him I did not want the conclusions of the report presented to the principals the next day because it was preliminary, it wasn't approved, Tick didn't agree with it, the drug czar didn't agree with the draft, and it hadn't had peer review. Why he could Captain present all the data, he could present the curves, he could present the information, but he wasn't to present any of the conclusions and comments about other studies and other reports because it hadn't been vetted, hadn't gotten any review, and I didn't feel it was appropriate to present a draft report to principles that reach conclusions uh, that, that had not been verified. So I instructed them not to present that report and their conclusions to the principals. It was a meeting that I prepared the agenda for. Uh, they're supposed to support me in information and, and track data, which they did. So they did their normal briefing, presented their normal information, but I did not want the conclusions of that report briefed to those principles because it was, as far as I was concerned, it hadn't been verified and it was inconclusive. I don't, if, I don't if, brief uh, my staff uh, and principals uh, at principals meetings on things that, that we haven't verified that are factual yet. If this report was so bad and so badly put together and so misinforming, um, and according to you and also um, Joe McCaffrey, that, that it was, uh, it was not uh, good data, good research. I, uh, I wouldn't say it was bad data, bad research, or poorly put together. I would say is that it, it had not been completed. It was draft number two. I think they appeared before you earlier today with draft number four, which is still a draft. It hadn't been accepted. It hadn't been completely reviewed. Do you agree with the, the basic conclusions then relative to the RAND study and also with basic conclusions on interdiction? I don't agree that any one report, whether it be the RAND study or the IDA report, uh, that, that supports one notion uh, that there's uh, uh, a major silver bullet that'll help our drug problem uh, is a valid report. I think we have to take into account all the information available and have a balanced approach on treatment, prevention, intradiction, 
source country programs. They all have to be worked concurrently, uh, and it takes a tremendous bipartisan effort to make that happen. And, and that will be the only thing that will give the American people the will to win, and we'll be able to make some progress in this area. On the RAND data specifically, because that was in, contained in the report, do you agree or not agree with the criticism of the RAND data? My comments to IDA was I neither agreed nor disagreed. Rather, I thought it was inappropriate for them in an interdiction coordinator report to report on a RAND report, which was a demand side report, and it appeared to me that they were trying to enhance their own report. Rather, I directed them to concentrate on interdiction data uh, and report on that. And if that was valid and withstood peer review, then whatever they put forth would stand on its own two feet. I thought it was inappropriate in a report to me to comment on demand data. I'm a supply side manager in this war on drugs. I'm the interdiction coordinator. Uh, and it, to me, the, the information they were trying to present on RAND data didn't belong in the interdiction report to me. Captain Boyer, I guess independently of you, wrote uh, and, and said good work on this report. But he recommended that they take that information out. His uh, good work, and, and I would agree, I think they've done a lot of work. They've taken a lot of data, 30,000 data points. They've figured out how to smooth it, how to present it. Uh, they must be doing a good job. We've been holding hearings on it, certainly. I think well. we've given this report more attention than about any other report recently that's been put together by any analyst. Well, it's I, certainly I controversial. Enough. I, 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 I guess my personal conclusion to this, before I turn, turn it over to Mr. Micah, I think we probably, uh, I mean, Mr. Cummings, excuse me. You all right? Okay. I'm, I'm still here. We're going we're gonna to live, we'll, we'll live through this. Okay. Uh, I, uh, uh, I guess my conclusion would be is maybe we're doing too many reports and too many studies. We need people like yourself who basically know what we need to do to win the war on drugs who frankly, um, in terms of interdiction, you previously testified before this subcommittee. You've been pretty much right on. Um, I guess where we go from here is if in the final analysis we start putting more money into interdiction and source country programs and we stop cutting to the bone um, and we take a realistic review of whether treatment is really working or whether it isn't, uh, if we return some of those assets that we took away in 1992 and 1993 when we really were doing some good things, um, then I guess it doesn't matter whether people heard the wrong thing outside the room or whatever. I think the important thing is we move on and we start winning the war on drugs. And that's what I really care about. And uh, you've done some really great things. Uh, I, I just wish that uh, somehow, uh, you know, we we had a little bit of discussion, some more information as we were putting the appropriations bills together. We probably would have given you more assets because I think I feel a little bit more confident the fact that we'd get a better bang for the buck. But with that, I will turn it over to my good friend, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Um, Am I, I uh, too, I share the uh, feelings of our chairman um, with regard to your integrity. And I, I'll tell you, um, and, and in your efforts, one of the things, one of the most moving moments of my life, days of my life, was one of my first hearings here when you and some of your board subordinates came in and talked about your efforts and what you had to do uh, in the waters, various oceans and whatever. And I went back to my community and, I mean, they were very skeptical about what was being done, but when I told them about some of the stories that you all told, your efforts and putting your lives on the line, um, they were very moved, and so I just want you to know that, that I want you to continue doing what you're doing. Um, but let me ask you just a, a few questions, because, um, and I want to comment on another thing. Um, the word lying is a very, very serious word in, in my estimation. As a, criminal, as a criminal lawyer for 20 years, a trial lawyer, that is not some, some word that I use lightly. And I want you to understand that my questions, I have not heard anybody lie today. I mean, and, and, I, and I have a listening ear for inconsistencies. I think basically what we had was some people that, that even admitted that there was some conjecture, that they had opinions, things that they didn't even hear. They heard loud voices in the room and all this kind of thing. Um, that is not enough to accuse anybody publicly on C-SPAN of lying. 
I have a major problem with that because people's reputations are most important. So having said that, let me ask you this. Did General McCafferty at any time, to your knowledge, ever try to thwart this, uh, the effort to get this report out? Did you, did you get that impression or do you, do you know that? No, he did not. He did not agree with the fundamental premise of the report, but he knew that it hadn't gotten peer review and he ordered that peer review uh, be obtained for it, which was, uh, which was done and is done. And, and all of the results of that have now, most of the results of that have been, been submitted to this committee. One of the things that you said that really that uh, kind of caught me off guard, and I just have to ask you about it, you talked about this tick. Uh, the interdiction committee. Yeah. Yes. What is that? The interdiction committee uh, used to be called the border interdiction committee. It's a committee headed up by the commissioner of customs, and for years had been co-chaired by the commandant of the coast guard. Uh, it has two functions. One is it reports border interdiction. Uh, philosophy and strategy to the drug czar. It reports directly to ONDCP. And its second function is to advise me as the interdiction coordinator on uh, the different issues uh, that come up in interdiction that I, that I can't coordinate and solve by myself. These are the bosses, if you will, of almost all of the agencies who are involved in, in interdiction. Would you say that these people are more or less have become experts over time in with regard to interdiction? It's the Commissioner of Customs. It's the Administrator of the DEA. Uh, and so they have the a J3 great interest in interdiction. Is that correct? That's their job. Okay. Uh, and, and they advise me, and I brought this report to them two months before I brought it to the drug czar. And, and that's exactly what, they what I'm trying to get to. You're going a little fast for me. Um, you presented this report before it even got to the czar. Is that right? Over two months before it got to him, correct. And they had the same opinion that you needed some peer review? Stronger than that. They said the report was incomplete. There weren't enough data, re data points. It needed a lot of work. Uh, they invited the analysts to get together with their agencies. I know the administrator of DEA invited the analysts to get together with his analysts and DEA uh, to start working over some of the data. Uh, they needed more data from Health and Human Services, and I tried to get that for them. It needed a lot of work. So by the time you got to the drug czar, you had already had some opinions from TIC. Uh, opinions from the top interdiction coordinator administrators in, in the nation. I'm just curious. When you talked to the drug czar, did you say, Mr. Drug czar, um, I've already talked to TIC, and this is what they said, or did you just go into him and present No, I absolutely told him I had vetted this before Tick, what Tick's opinion was, uh, but that this was something that he had to know was a work in progress because it presented data that hadn't been compared before. Uh, in particular, it was focusing on Green Clover, which was an operation that General McCaffrey ran as Southcom. Uh, and you told him this? You sure. told the drugs I, are that? Oh, yes, I showed him that exactly. And so, so is, it un, is it unusual? Would it, be on you, would, would it have surprised you if the drug czar's um, decision had differed from Tick? In other words, if you said all of this to the drug czar and the drug czar said, hey, I, I don't care about what Tick says, let's get this out immediately, would that have surprised you? No, I, I think what it would have surprised me if he had uh, totally uh, gone against what the interdiction committee was, uh, was recommending, which was peer review that the report wasn't ready to be published uh, and that the data hadn't been sufficiently developed. Now, let me ask you this other thing. This has been a lot made of this whole light of day. Did I ever see the light of day? Did Mr. Uh, uh, the drug czar ever say to you, I don't want this to ever see the light of day? No, that was never said. I don't have anything else. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Micah. Mr. Chairman. Did uh, General McCaffrey say to you that uh, not a word of this report is to get out? I, I can't hear you, sir. Did uh, General McCaffrey say that not a word of this report is to get out? No, he never March, said that. At that March meeting? No, he, it when was you were, in May. It was uh, May the 7th or May the 8th, 8th of May. Now, That's was when it, we was met. There That's a meeting, when was, there a me him. was there a meeting in March? No, there was not. The uh, first time I briefed General McCaffrey as interdiction coordinator and presented the draft findings of the report uh, wait that IDA was waiting in his outer office to give him a full briefing and, if so he you, desired you was on did the 8th not, of May. You did not meet with the general in March? 
I did not present an IDA report to him in March, not that I recall. I believe it was the 8th of May. But the document we have says the fi final draft, or draft final, May uh, 1996. Is this the report? Are you sure about that now? Uh, now, when you were driving, were you driving back? Did uh, you make a comment, uh, or did you, one of your assistants make a comment that not a word of this report is to get out after meeting with the general? I have, I never made that comment. Did I you did hear not, anyone else? I did not drive back with them, so I wouldn't know if anyone made that comment or who it was. So, but it wasn't, it wasn't you, and that, you didn't hear that remark made in the room when you spent time with the general? No, in fact, but I specifically told IDA that they were to not to present the conclusions of the report the next day to the principals group in the Pentagon, the meeting that I had called of all these commanders, because the data was still inconclusive and, but and hadn't had peer review. So I told them not called, to present it. You had called that meeting, and they were prepared to, to have that meeting that next day, right? And hear that report. That's correct. And before that, you had decided to uh, have that meeting, present that report. Well, what influenced you not to, uh, to change your mind and suddenly not have that meeting? Two, in two things influenced me. The first thing influenced me was that the interdiction committee uh, still had not changed their mind. They felt the report had not been vetted. And I presented a, a preliminary, my version of it, to General McCaffrey. He disagreed with it, asked me if it was a final report. I told him no. So he influenced that decision then somewhat. Are you? If you had met with him, you would have been uh, presenting that report, right? Uh, I'm not sure that I would have. Uh, well, then the meeting would have been just uh, gone on without you. What, what meeting is the that? The meeting you said that you canceled the next day. No, I, <clears throat> the meeting was a, the second day of a two-day conference. Uh, uh, of the eight hours of that meeting, this, this uh, report, it this was a one-half-hour presentation of the eight-hour meeting. This report wasn't vetted. Did you also testify that you first presented this report in January of 96? To the tick, that's correct. Uh, draft one. But it hadn't been vetted. And you don't remember a meeting in, in March, uh, uh, right after uh, he took over as drug czar, McCaffrey took over as drug czar to present this? No, I think I presented it to him in May. I could be wrong with the dates, but I think it was in May when I first presented it to him. And you don't recall of any, anyone's uh, making those comments. Uh, did uh, are, were you aware of any uh, efforts by the drug czar's office to keep this uh, report uh, from coming to Congress? None. Were, did you see any memos that said that uh, this should not uh, uh, be in any way, uh, any of this information released to Congress? No, I don't did recall. Did you uh, produce any memos that said that uh, uh, this report uh, should not uh, uh, be released in any fashion? The only thing I can recall is saying that the report had not been completed, it was still a draft, and before we accepted its conclusions, we needed to be a final report approved uh, from the contractor by the sponsor who was DOD. Haven't you been concerned for some time that the um, cutting of, uh, of the uh, drug interdiction program was a policy of failure? Uh, and uh, didn't you see results in uh, your responsibility, uh, your areas of responsibility, the Coast Guard, uh, in and around Puerto Rico, for example, dramatic uh, drug uh, uh, increases? And uh, Yes, I did. And did you take action? Didn't you write uh, uh, Lee Brown, the, the drug czar, uh, in uh, 1994, and uh, express your alarm and uh, also ask for a meeting? Uh, with the president uh, uh, and the national security advisor, because you thought it got so it was getting so serious that it, in fact, um, let me read priority of countering narco trafficking as a threat to the national security of the United States. Uh, didn't did you did you express that concern to uh, the drugs the former drugs are? I absolutely did, but I'd like to explain in what context it was expressed because I think it's very important. Presidential Decision Directive 14 that I explained to you before gave me uh, four primary objectives to achieve. 
uh, also spoke to a gradual change in strategy. It was called a gradual shift from interdiction in the transit zone to source country. Uh, IDA report focuses on the effect of source country interdiction, if you will, things like uh, disrupting the air bridge uh, and, its, uh, and its potential effect uh, in their views on price and purity and on demand. What had not taken place was the shift. Uh, the President's strategy uh, had not been implemented either by the agencies uh, or by the Congress. Rather, interdiction resources had been reduced, as shown on curves previously at this hearing, and the resources not put into source country programs. In fact, source country programs have been reduced at the same time. And so the memo I wrote to Dr. Brown, which you cite, was that we should not continue to reduce interdiction resources. Rather, we should bring them back up to prior year's levels until a source country strategy was effective and investments were made in the source country, which I believe is an effective strategy. So what had happened was the gradual shift didn't take place. We cut interdiction, didn't make the investment in the source strategy, and, and, and I saw that as problematic and, you knew we and advised were, the drugs are that. You knew we were headed for disaster then? I wouldn't say disaster, but it was in the wrong direction. And uh, let me ask you, too, uh, the direct results we saw with cocaine seizures in the tra transit zones declined from a peak of 70,000 kilograms in 92 to 37,000 kilograms in 95. Is that correct? That's correct. And does, what's the Coast Guard's responsibility uh, as far as Puerto Rico, isn't it, to uh, guard the waters around uh, uh, Puerto Rico? Our responsibility uh, in Puerto Rico is the same as it is everywhere in the maritime area. The Coast hadn't, Guard's the lead agency for interdicting drugs in the, in the your, maritime area. Hadn't your resources been dramatically uh, cut by Congress? Uh, and I have the uh, amounts of... Uh, by approximately 40 or 50 percent over the last to, four years. 40 to 50 percent. And That's that correct. was from, uh, from 93 to 95? Uh, basically, probably from 1991 or 2 to 95. That's correct. I have 92 to 95 when the, the other party controlled uh, uh, the uh, Congress and made uh, those decisions. And what you announced this morning was... Uh, the resumption of your program in Puerto Rico, and uh, isn't it true that this subcommittee under uh, the, the chairman took a, uh, our subcommittee to Puerto Rico to examine this problem? You held a, uh, a hearing uh, based on a GAO study that indicated 28 percent of the narcotics, particularly cocaine, uh, came through uh, the Puerto Rico area of responsibility this spring. I testified at that hearing. Subsequently, the chairman held a field hearing in Puerto Rico where I had Vice Admiral Loy, my Atlantic Area Commander, but, uh, wasn't testify. But wasn't the conclusion that there was a serious problem there and didn't this committee uh, membership come back and, uh, and get the funds that uh, were, are being announced today to support this program? Is that uh, correct? I, I was very happy that the committee uh, paid attention to the GAO study mm -hmm. that held the field hearing. I thought it was uh, excellent, but I would point out uh, that I had made Puerto Rico a major issue to the drug czar almost a year ago. And nothing was done. I had pointed out that to General McCaffrey the first time I met with him, and in the supplemental appropriation that the President sent to Congress in April, requested funds for the Coast Guard to do the Puerto Rican operations. I believe that was about the same time you were holding the hearings, if not before it. I think Gen we're all on the same wavelength. General what Mc you've done has certainly helped. General McCaffrey said uh, he was afraid that the report would be throwing him a bouquet, and I, I was concerned that the uh, report would be throwing him a bomb. And uh, the GAO uh, report that is? No, the IDA report. <laughs> it supported more uh, uh, concentration on interdiction and source uh, uh, depression uh, of. Uh, the drug trade. There is no question, and I, I've testified before this committee before, uh, that we were short of resources to do interdiction in the transit zone, short of resources to do interdiction and, and, and finance source country programs. 
I think uh, in, in over 10 hearings, you've created a public record. Uh, and I applaud uh, this particular committee and its oversight in doing that uh, for showing uh, that we need to do more to accomplish goals number four and five of the strategy. I will say that I recently, uh, the first week in August, uh, got all the commanders together again in the Pentagon for two days. I had them review the new 1996 strategy that General McCaffrey has presented to this committee. Uh, I asked them what their, their major issues were in not being able to uh, implement that strategy approximately one-third of those issues were resource-related issues, all of which were requested in the President's supplemental request in April, and I believe now all of which you financed at the conclusion of this last week's appropriation omnibus bill. So finally, you did not uh, uh, repeat one more time. You did not hear General McCaffrey say that not a word of this report was to get out. No, he never said that okay. to my Mr. knowledge. Mr. Chairman, uh, it may be necessary to refer uh, a matter of conflict that's, uh, that we have heard presented before our investigations and oversight subcommittee uh, today, uh, conflict, direct conflict and testimony uh, uh, to the Justice Department. And I would like to consult with staff and with you on this matter. And uh, I think that uh, it, it should be uh, further explored and that should be uh, further considered by uh, our uh, subcommittee and it's uh, that regretful that I that. must ask that. Your Thank you. Expired. Um, Admiral, I, I, I showed this to uh, General McCaffrey, but let me just uh, point out, and you're well familiar with these numbers, I'm sure, uh, interdiction efforts, uh, we showed two billion in 1991, a million nine, in 92, a million five in 1993, a million three in 94, a million 280 in 1995, a million 1339 in 1996. And I, you know, I also refer to a uh, uh, United States In Addition Coordinator uh, Memorandum of 1995 that you wrote in June, listing all the assets that were pulled out of the drug war. And um, I only have one motivation here, and the motivation is, is where are we going? And, uh, you know, we, we've discussed on several occasions uh, what's happened since 1992 in terms of interdiction, where we had a success, where are we going, where do we need, we've made some changes. Um, you're fairly familiar with, with the uh, resources we put in the current budget for 97. Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, is it everything you need? Right, I think we're going in the right direction. Okay. Now, does, is there a stop sign 100 yards out and we've done enough? Or, or we're, are we winning this thing? I mean, I, I, I've been at a couple of Coast Guard functions as well as a lot of functions around. And, and, uh, and I ask people, you know, are we winning the drug war? And I don't see any hands go up. And, and tell me from, from your heart, where are we going and what's it going to take? And are we doing enough? Let's get out of We're the winning. back room stuff. We are, if you would call it a war, we are winning the war on drugs. I have to look at a 10-year... Why, why wouldn't we call it a war? We, some people don't like to call it a war. I'll call it a war because I think it is. Uh, we need a couple of elements to win. Uh, I think we're winning when I take a look over the last 10 years of the amount overall in a population that drug use has gone down uh, and what's happened in the United States. I still uh, think it's a major problem, number one or two on the list with the American people. I think uh, most of our major crime is, uh, at least 60 percent of it, is uh, directly related to, uh, to drug abuse. Uh, I think that General McCaffrey, in fact I know, is putting us back on track with a balanced approach, that we have to do all of these things concurrently, treatment, prevention, source country programs, interdiction. I feel we're short in interdiction. It's only 9 or 10 percent of the total budget. I've testified before it needs to be probably around 13 or 14 percent. I think the President's 14. supplemental reflects that, and your, and your record shows that. And I think we're headed in the right direction. The action that Congress took on appropriations bill this year is in the right direction. And I'm hopeful uh, that when the agencies analyze what took place this Congress, 
and they, as they're preparing their 1998 budgets, that they will ask for the remainder that's necessary to have a robust interdiction and source country program to complement our treatment and prevention and education program. How much more is necessary? As of April of this year, probably uh, 250 to 350 million dollars was necessary. The president's supplemental requested 250 million. Now, I'm not sure how much Congress appropriated this weekend because my staff is still sorting that out because it came in many different accounts. But I think we're getting very close, Mr. Chairman. And uh, and you feel that with that number, that brings us up to the 13 or 14 percent. I think it should bring us close to 13 uh, percent as, as a portion of the total pie. Uh, I've not had a chance to analyze that. Should we go back to the three billion dollars or whatever the top chart was in 92? No. At that particular time, those numbers are a little bit skewed. We were buying equipment. We were buying sensors. We were buying intelligence systems. We have all of that now. Uh, what we didn't have enough of was op tempo, ship time, plane time. Uh, sailors and soldiers and DEA agents and customs agents actually out there. We've had major decreases in the government to balance the budget. The Coast Guard has been reduced by 4,000 people and $400 million a year over the last three years in order to meet our balanced budget requirements. But I, I, I think, though, with all due respect, sir, that, that uh, we do have to balance our budget, but we are putting assets and putting priorities on the drug war in spite of that. And we're certainly trying to do both, uh, as, as you know, Mr. Chairman. And I think both can be done. You've, we've made some major adjustments. Uh, you asked me uh, what it would take. Uh, it'll take those assets, those resources, but more than that, it'll take a bipartisan effort to keep this in front of the American people, because it's going to take all of us together on educating our children, making it a national priority, providing the resources to the agencies, whether it's in education, prevention, interdiction, or source country, and one heck of a lot of cooperation by our foreign partners. You cannot accomplish source country programs without total cooperation with Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, Venezuela. You know, you were there. I was there. Uh, one thing you haven't talked about that is most important, we talk about all of this IDA data, uh, the reason we disrupted the air bridge wasn't because of IDA data. IDA certainly gave us all the air tracks in that particular area. It was clear that by disrupting that bridge, it would drive the price of coca paste. 60% uh, of all the coca leaves in the world are grown in Peru. 80% of all the cocaine that comes to the United States comes from those coca leaves that get transported to Colombia for processing. If we could disrupt that, it would drive the price of coca leaves below normal crops like pineapples, bananas, and soybeans. And that's exactly what President Fujimori needed to develop an alternative crop program. But wasn't that there... transpired, as you know. I th you probably met with him, too, and he probably told you the same thing. We achieved that with Operation Laser Strike at this particular time. But didn't, wasn't there as a, what, weren't we feuding with President Fujimori over a period of maybe two years? Uh, and then we finally agree that to, to support that policy and, and w wasn't there some problems prior to the air bridge? Well, there were problems prior to the air bridge because he was at war with Ecuador, number one, and some of the okay. equipment that he'd need to, to prosecute his end on the war on drugs. Uh, there were some thoughts that he might have to be using it for military means and all of those other State Department related policies which, uh, which came into a... play. I think we have a pretty clear path on what Peru is doing now in cooperation with the United States to shut the air bridge down. Mr. Mike. Closing uh, comments. Uh, one, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I think uh, it's important that we look at this whole uh, question of uh, success, of interdiction, of uh, uh, trying to attack a narcotics problem and trafficking and uh, source countries and uh, transit zones and uh, other questions that have been raised here. I'm still very concerned and very uh, alarmed that, in fact, that, uh, that this subcommittee that deals with oversight of this issue that's been wor working so closely with these agencies, 
uh, did not get a copy of this report. Now I'm even more concerned that this uh, report was still was originally vetted in uh, January. Uh, I'm I'm very concerned that uh, the report uh, ha has been massaged to death. That uh, uh, and it it was kept from us during a critical period when we were making decisions on. Uh, the direction of policy, again, in a time of limited resources with our uh, taxpayers footing the bill and with seeing the results of uh, a disastrous policy on our streets and with our children. So I, I thank you for holding uh, the hearing. I uh, regret that uh, uh, I, I don't think we've gotten the whole story, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey says, and I think we need to uh, look at this and we also need to keep these folks on track. But. Uh, I thank you as our last uh, hearing probably uh, together, at least in Washington, uh, for your tremendous, tremendous leadership, what you've done, your personal sacrifices, and your commitment to do this at, at uh, tremendous personal uh, cost to yourself and, uh, uh, and your family. But you, have, uh, you are responsible for getting this uh, moving, and I'm dismayed again by what I've seen uh, here today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, and I think it has been a, a uh, very much of a group effort uh, with a whole bunch of people uh, getting it back on track. I guess my last question, Admiral, is um, do we have, how do you judge success? How do you figure out whether we're on the right track and uh, in terms of interdiction? Do you have quantifiable goals and maybe just kind of, you know, you have a lot of assets at your disposal. The total uh, measure of success uh, to me is only uh, one measurement that needs to take place and to look at our overall population uh, and as a combination of all the programs uh, that we've mentioned including interdiction, uh, the measure of success would be if drug use in the United States declines. If drug use in the United States doesn't decline through all of the populations, not just our children, uh, but the casual users uh, uh, and different elements of our populations, then the entire program is not successful. I thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your uh, testimony today and again uh, for your commitment to your country and not only in the drug war but in, in your total commitment. Uh, again, my comments to you uh, earlier uh, still stand. I have tremendous respect for you and the uniform you wear. And uh, I think you're one of our great assets, and I wish you well. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to combine the last two panels, if we can. Um, and as uh, I'll just introduce as those folks uh, come forward. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tom Snitch. Dr. Snitch is currently president of Little Falls Associates Incorporated and director of federal research programs for Golden Gate University. Formerly, he was a senior methodologist methodology expert at the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Snitch, we thank you for being here today. At this point, I'd also like to welcome Dr. Peter Ryder. Did I pronounce that right? Ryder. Dr. Ryder is a professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Affairs. Uh, formerly, he served as co-director of the Drug Policy Research Center at the Rand Corporation. Dr. Ryder, we, uh, Ryder, thank you for being here today. Uh, why don't we start with you, Dr. Snitch? If you would, uh, if you stand, I would need to uh, swear you in, if you would. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. If you would like to uh, condense uh, your testimony, if you would, and the balance of your written testimony will certainly be uh, accepted for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I only want to make a few quick points here. Uh, it's been number one, a rather long day, and number two, an I'm interesting day. Though, hasn't it? Very interesting, and uh, even even more important in, in, my, in my terms. I'm very anxious to find out what the Baltimore Orioles are doing since they started two hours ago, and the game should just about be over by now. So I'd like to see what the uh, the Orioles did today. Uh, your, your your task to me was to examine the methodological soundness and basic scientific veracity of the IDA study. Uh, I took a look at this study, uh, the RAND study, and some of the critiques uh, that were provided to me. And, and I look at this, at this assignment, and I, and I take the position of being a social scientist. Uh, my background and, and training is in methodological approaches and how to develop rigorous analytical ways to study empirical data sets and then to apply those, those approaches to looking at uh, significant international policy issues. 
I am not by any means a drug expert. I instead take a look at this as, as from a methodological point of view and try and look at some of the ways that if you came to me and asked me some of the questions that were presented today and asked of IDA, how would I go about providing you with those answers in a rigorous scientific fashion? I just want to make three quick points and then, then we can open it up for, for some questions. Uh, after reading the IDA study, uh, I think that given the, the, the assumptions that were placed on the study, the, the data issues, and we could talk about that more later, which I think is one of the real uh, uh, key issues here. Uh, if, if you look at how they approach this issue, and when you really come down to it, what IDA is trying to do is provide empirical data to what I would argue is, is almost a common sense or an intuitive argument. That is, if you were to say to me, if you were to decrease the supply of, of drugs coming into the United States from Latin America, would you expect that that would in some way have a resultant impact on the amount of supply of drugs available? And therefore, if the uh, amount of supply of drugs is, is changed, would that affect the price? If you were to ask me that question, I would say that sounds logical to me. But if you look at it from a scientific point of view, you would have to go back and collect empirical data and try to verify the, the correctness of that supposition. I think the IDA uh, is, is basically doing some cutting edge, edge research because they are looking at some very difficult variables and some very difficult data collection issues which I think that uh, are important to provide into this whole debate over drug strategy. Uh, if you look and, and just try and, and, and imagine, if you were to ask me what is the street price of cocaine in the United States, how would you go about finding out what that was? Well, we have all sorts of data points here that from DEA data that was collected from people who were out there making supposed buys for this. I suppose we could go out and, and ask people in prisons how much they charged or how much they paid for, for cocaine. Or perhaps we could even go out on the street and, and try to create a, a data collection survey, something that I don't think I would want to do, that is ask buyers and, and, and sellers of cocaine how much they were charging. But what they have done here is tried to look at a longitudinal uh, study that is the price of cocaine on the street over time and look at fluctuations. And if you look at their graphs, you will see that indeed there are uh, marked changes in the price of cocaine on the streets of the United States. The question then comes down to what causes those changes? And I think what IDA is trying to look at, and I don't think that in their conclusions they would state that interdiction is the only reason that you find uh, prices increasing in, on the streets, but that interdiction efforts have had some type of impact on the price of cocaine uh, in the United States. Now we can argue all you want about price elasticities of demand and we can look at what is the elasticity of a heavy user vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a light user, but I think what IDA is trying to do is set the stage in terms of putting a, an issue on the table for discussion to look and try to quantify the impact of uh, source interdiction as it uh, applies to actual pricing mechanisms. So I think that, that there are some, some flaws and some, some, some of the analysis that they have done in their study I might do a little differently, but overall I think it's a very useful effort. I think as a scientist I would like to see studies like this put on the table for open discussion and, and I think much of the uh, discussion here in the hearings today has been very useful. Uh, from a more editorial point of view, I would just say that uh, from what I understand, this is a federally funded study. Uh, it is unclassified. And I think that it behooves both uh, myself as a scientist and myself as a taxpayer to have the ability to look at these, these studies when we begin to debate policy issues. And therefore, uh, I see no reason why this study uh, shouldn't, be re shouldn't be released and shouldn't be available for public discussion among interested parties. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I ask that my written statement be placed in the record. Without objection. Thanks. Um, 
As you stated, I was at RAND for some years and was involved in the management of the study that's uh, referred to here as the RAND study, and probably provided some of the intellectual underpinnings for it. In an earlier study I did of interdiction for the uh, Department of Defense in 1980, 1988. Um, the IDA study is in heart very simple. It begins by asserting that there was a marked success in drug policy in 1989. The IDA researchers observed that the price of cocaine, which had fallen sharply throughout the 1980s, stabilized after 1989. That was defined as a success because the researchers claimed that absent some new effect, newly effective government intervention, the price of cocaine would have fallen to $25, less than half, less than half the figure the estimate, estimated it stabilized at in 1989. This is absolutely critical to the whole analysis. This is no longer facts. This is a theoretical projection on their part. The only basis they offer for that projection is a statement by Mark Moore, a professor at Harvard, about what the price of cocaine would be if legal, and a statement that, quote, exponential decay in prices might be expected for a commodity in a saturated market characterized by unconstrained competition. I have no idea where that statement comes from and no references provided for it. It may indeed be that looking at the graph of prices as a physicist, you would indeed see that decline, but in economics there's no basis for making that, that statement. The next question that the IDA researchers asked was what would explain this apparent success? I will, for the moment, leave aside the, uh, their claim that there was a success. Their answer was that this success must be uh, the result of more effective interdiction efforts by the US and producer countries. Since they claimed there were three upturns in the price series they had constructed that occurred shortly after the launch of three interdiction operations. From this, they concluded that interdiction operations should be credited with all reductions in cocaine consumption resulting from the price increase that they inferred. Did not measure, they inferred. Interdiction was then seen to be an extraordinarily cost-effective program, achieving a 1% reduction in cocaine consumption for $8 million. This contrasts dramatically with the RAND estimate that source country and interdiction programs require $350 to $800 million to accomplish that same reduction. There is no basis for this. Their measurement of price, well, sorry, there's no basis for this because, in fact, there were many other things that, went, that affect the price of cocaine. It is not simply driven by government expenditures on interdiction. For example, over the last uh, 10 years, an increasing number of persons have been locked up for drug selling offenses. Presumably, that has some effect on the supply curve for drugs. It has made this business more risky, and one presumes that that has had an effect just as interdiction will have an effect by increasing riskiness. The other central problem of the study is that the measures of price are highly questionable. There are already in existence some well-documented price series published by the APT Corporation under contract to ONDCP published over a number of years. Well-documented, well-analyzed using exactly the same data. There's no reference to these series in the IDA study and they show a very different Level of prices, that is the street price of cocaine per pure gram is more like $125 rather than $50. And more just as importantly, they don't show the two upturns in retail cocaine prices that the IDA series shows in 1992 and 1995. There is a modest upturn in 1995. It's so small that it could simply be noisy, uh, noisy data. These data are not collected by scientists in white coats and sterile labs even by clerks writing down numbers from supermarket labels. They come from undercover purchases in markets characterized by lots of cheating and uncertainty. The IDA study then has a spurious, uh, a spurious uh, price increase, uh, which is in conflict uh, with uh, what is available from, from other sources. Um, the um, the other sort of major failing here is that in looking at prices, they look only at what they claim are retail prices. In fact, if interdiction is effective on prices, what you expect to see is a rise in import prices and then wholesale prices and eventually retail prices. 
is what is made immediately risky and expensive is smuggling, and smugglers sell not in the retail market, but in the wholesale market. In fact, the app series for wholesale shows no such increase in wholesale prices in 1992 or 1995. They continue to decline, and any increase in retail prices is more reasonably attributed to changes in enforcement at the local level, or at least domestically, if DEA also operates at that lower level of, um, of the market. My written testimony has a few more details about some of the technical failings of the study, which I think is very weak. The failure of the authors to cite most of the published research on drug prices and markets is simply remarkable. The claim that these are data that have not been analyzed before is simply untrue. Every price series here, except one, has been regularly published, and even that last series, the Smith-Klein Beecham, uh, Smith-Klein um, uh, testing data, have also been analyzed by at least one other, uh, one other part person. Uh, they would, one would at least have expected them to address why their price series looks so different from the price series that had already been published. Let me conclude by saying the weakness of this, pol of this study has no policy meaning whatsoever. Interdiction might indeed be more effective than RAND researchers, including myself, have previously estimated. The volume of research in this area is scandalously small, and it's easy to raise questions about the few studies that have been done. I, mean, I would say the RAND study in controlling cocaine is far and away the best study of these issues. That's easy enough. There are no other studies of this issue until this one is actually published. John Calkins, a major contributor to the work in this area, has undertaken a number of of conceptual pieces that I think provide the basis for the next generation of studies in this area that might enrich the results of the, of the, of the RAND work. There's new evidence about the elasticity of prices that suggests that demand is more responsive to price increases than was assumed by the RAND model and by the IDA analysts. If Congress and high-level decision makers in the executive branch wish to make decisions about allocation of resources amongst federal drug control programs in a reasonable way, then they will have to push agencies into investing in systematic analysis and data collection. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hassett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very quickly, uh, uh, interesting in your presentation, Dr. Ruder, uh, you use words like scurrilous and scandalous. Is there so, a, say that again? Scurrilous is a word you use. I don't think use. I use scurrilous. Oh, you did. And scandalous. Spurious. spurious. Well, I thought it was scurrilous. No, it I was spurious. Oh, all right. Well, I just wondered Scurrils. if there was Scurrils. empirical evidence to, 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 you know, put a qualitative base on what is scurrilous and what is scandalous in your uh, empirical evidence. Sorry, I, I, I simply was referring to something being a spurious correlation, a, a spurious observation. It's I'm nothing sorry. about uh, not impunity. You did we use the word scandalous too, so. Uh, that's fine. I, I just thought that that was rather unscientific. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. S Dr. Snitch, in your estimate of the IDA study, were good scientific data used? They used the data that was available. Uh, as was just stated, the, the data collections in this area are few and far between. And I think it's rather difficult sometimes to get very good data on what actually is uh, the price of cocaine on the street at any given time. But as I said before, if you look at their, their, their analysis over time, uh, I, I believe that they used the best data that was available to them and did their analysis with that. Yes, sir. So how about the conclusions they drew from it? Is there, are they sound conclusions or not? I would argue that the the conclusions as, as I've read the study and looking at the data and the, 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 the restraints that they were working on. I don't know what, what IDA's tasking order originally was and what they were asked to look at, but if, if you follow the study as they have carried it out, I think that their, their conclusions uh, can be substantiated by the data. Yes, sir. Well, my understanding is they were doing studies. They started out you know, as a physicist doing this study, but they found that uh, they were looking at over the surface, you know, over the horizon uh, radar, and they got involved in tracking drug planes, and they found out when they started to put a real tight kibosh on uh, drug trafficking that there was a reaction in the, in, the, in the market. So I guess that's how they got started. I'm not sure if that's uh, 
uh, probably as an economist, they, we'd want models and everything else to, to fit into there, but uh, there is an action and reaction, so to speak, which is, I guess, the physicists look at this, um, and can you say that after you look at this evidence that there is a, a cause and an effect here? I, I see correlations uh, on, on the data that was presented. Uh, trying to determine causality is, is much more difficult. I think you'd have to go to, into, into a multivariate analysis type of uh, situation. But again, in looking at the data, when they, when they show you data and pricing over time and then they superimpose upon that data various external events, i.e. interdiction efforts, and you see a short time lag and then you start to see increases in prices. Now maybe that may be coincidence. But nonetheless, that is showing that there is a trend evident on, on, on their data. And you know, we're sitting here and trying to make policy, long-term policy. It might be a year, two years, maybe five years. And uh, you know, we don't have perfect data uh, to make any decision on. Part of it comes from the Sir, I don't think you'll ever get perfect data, and that's, that's probably not the issue. It's the, the best data you can have. Right. As I said in my and, remarks and make, earlier, I think it would have been very useful for you if you would have had this study and this debate that we're having today, perhaps four months ago or five months ago, before you got into appropriations and authorizations and, po and policy uh, issues, as opposed to the day after the new fiscal year started. Well, I agree, because, uh, well, we have another fiscal year coming up, but I was the person who had to try to persuade or discuss it with a lot of the appropriation subcommittee chairman. Uh, thank you. I'm going to yield back, Mr. Chairman. I, I, uh, I thank you, Mr. Hassett. Uh, I will. If I could, too. Uh, I, let me just take a second. Maybe this may be the appropriate time, maybe not. But, uh, you know, I've been able to work with you on this committee for a lot of years and especially the last year or so worked on this issue. You've been an exemplary and a very fine leader in this issue. I think a lot of the things that have been done today and have happened uh, in this whole issue would not have happened if not your leadership had taken place. So I, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, and I know a lot of those people who are out there, that this makes a real difference too. Uh, thank you. And uh, I know that uh, you're not going to walk away from this thing when your term in Congress ends, uh, that you'll be out there fighting along the way. Uh, I uh, appreciate all the efforts that you've put forward. I yield well, Thank you. It, it has been a great partnership. And I, I remember when we were down in Columbia, you and I went at lunchtime. We had a break. And rather than eating lunch, we went and talked to all the DEA agents that were there risking their lives and thanking them on behalf of the Congress. And uh, there are a lot of people out there around the world that are, that are fighting with very limited resources. And so the the stakes are awfully high, and I thank you very much, and it does have my commitment, mostly because I've got three great-grandchildren, you've got a family that you're worried about, too, and, and I think that's the future that we're worried about. And I, I guess I'll jump into your comment there that you kind of left. Um, wouldn't have been great if we had that information available four months ago. And you sat right up there listening to five hours of testimony. Uh, you know, what, where did you come out on all this discussion? We heard it, we didn't hear it. Uh, it's seven, you know, it's 12 months in the making and now it's seven months into it. We still don't have a final draft. We're not ready, it's not finished product. Uh, it's not prime time. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if I were listening to all this from the private sector, I'd probably go nuts. But what do you think? Uh, I, I spent some time running studies for the National Academy of Sciences and, and we ran into some of these same problems where you get draft after draft after draft. Uh, it comes to a point in time where you got to fish or cut bait, and uh, uh, it's time to put some uh, closure uh, to a study. Uh, again, I think you could make an argument, and, and many of the criticisms of this report I think are valid, but you can probably analyze this to death, and you can continue on if there's enough money coming in to, to the folks who are doing the study. They can keep analyzing, looking at new factors, new variables, almost ad infinitum. I think what you have to do is, is get a study that is, that is fairly well focused, bring some conclusions to the table, let people discuss them, beat them around. Uh, if indeed there are, are nonsense and garbage, well, then they'll be dismissed. Uh, if not, uh, analyze them. Uh, I, I think the important issue is to, is to get the information and to get the ideas out on the table so people can have the ability to give and take and, and, and either uh, uh, agree with them or disagree with them. 
so uh, the, the, I, I'm not going to argue that the, the study should have been released earlier, but there gets to a point in time where decisions have to be made about how many drafts you're going to do and, and when does it become released to the public. I would also say that it, perhaps it might have been useful in some of these earlier stages if they could have consulted with the Congress, knowing full well that you were involved in some of these policy-related and budgetary issues, to say, here's a study coming down the road which is going to raise some, some flags because it does contradict certain approaches that we now take. And I think it probably would have been useful for you to see that, even if the document hadn't been publicly released. Especially since we're part of the partnership that gives them the resources to do what they do. Most well, definitely. Huh? Mr. Chairman, could I comment? Sure. I think this is a document that is far too flimsy to be released. I've never seen peer review comments as totally damning as these ones. I do not think this is a study that can be rescued. The conclusions are not supported. And it would not indeed have been helpful in your deliberations. It is, uh, it is a study which, having been reviewed, has been found wanting in almost every relevant dimension. Well, there's certainly some strong disagreement with what you just said, and we have, and it's one nice thing about democracy, uh, we still don't have it resolved, whether it was adequate research or whether it wasn't, uh, there, whether there in fact it was covered process. up or whether it wasn't, and so we'll have to go uh, and, and solve that on, a, on another day. I, I do have, uh, on three pieces of the conclusions, I would like to ask you, Dr. Snitch, um, how you feel. Continue, one, in the first first one is continued narcotics, narcotics efforts have significantly reduced the scope of the cocaine epidemic as compared to the levels that would have resulted had the cocaine trade continued to operate unimpeded. Yes or no? I would think that would go without saying. True. Okay. Two, when pursued with aggressive focused actions, source zone interdiction efforts aimed at denial of production and transportation from the coca growing regions have consistently caused marked increases in the street price of cocaine. This suggests that a long-term denial strategy could have lasting effects on the cocaine market. Yes or no? Uh, can I make a, a, two insertions? It has caused uh, market temporary increases in the street price. If you look there, there are peaks and valleys. So it's not been a long term, but it's caused a and, temporary. And, and, and probably the reason is, is that they started into a three-month effort and then stopped it because of funding. And then Perhaps. Could be. I would say that the long-term denial strategy, if it was continuous, that is not stop and go, could lead, could have a lasting effect, okay. as opposed to episodic uh, uh, interdiction efforts that cause minor spikes in and, the... And the last one would be widely circulated analysis that have included a very low cost effectiveness for source zone interdiction, particularly as compared with treatment programs for heavy users, are counter to the empirical evidence. The discrepancy is largely attributed to the use in such analysis of an improper measure of zone of source zone interdiction effectiveness, unrealistic assumptions regarding the marginal cost of large scale additional treatments, and reliable and reliance upon a questionable model to fit uh, cocaine demand as a primary evaluation tool. Well, I, I don't know if I would agree with that because I haven't studied and gone over the, the, the RAND report. I would say that the RAND study was not an improper measure of so, source zone interdiction. It was a different measure. They were looking at different things. The, the, the IDA study is a supply study that is looking at interdictions in a zone outside the United States. The, the RAND study appears to be looking at seizures within the United States. If you had a very effective interdiction effort in, in Latin America and you cut off the uh, supply of cocaine in the United States down to zero, if measured by the RAND criteria, there would be no seizures and therefore you have a very ineffective policy. So th th they're, they're measuring apples and oranges here. Right. Mr. Ryder, Dr. Snitch, Dr. Ryder, thank you very much for your uh, testimony. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. During the Nixon administration, the Supreme Court ruled that presidents could invoke what's called executive privilege, allowing presidents to prevent the release to Congress of documents dealing with private talks between himself 
and members of his administration. Here's a look at House and Senate action. Tuesday, the House met briefly and did not conduct any legislative business.